Welcome to the 88th episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So damn paranormal. It's yummy paranormal. Mm. My name is Jason Knight, host of the show, and with me, as always, the lovely producer extraordinaire, Mr. Oscar Spector. Mr. Mango Chewing Oscar Spector. You brought us some mangoes that are just seeped in sugar and deliciousness. Yeah, right. The sugar really makes it really edible. Oh, it's good. <laughs> it's good. Just add more sugar to fruit. Guys, um, just a real quick tip. Um, dried mangoes is my new go-to, like, pre-buying you know, buying, uh, a snack I get when I go to the movies. Because I don't buy anything at the movie theater. They're expensive. So I buy these at a CVS or whatever. And uh, dried mangoes, excellent movie-watching snack. Huh. See, now I'm the opposite. I will, I will spend the money on movie popcorn. Yeah. There oh, you like movie popcorn. I can't get enough of movie popcorn. I mean, I like popcorn. Every time I go to movies, I get sick because I eat so much fucking popcorn. Yeah, and that's to say that I've never had it because obviously, like, I'm with people. Like, Lexi will have some, so yeah. she'll buy popcorn. Obviously, I'll have her popcorn too. But uh, I don't personally seek out to buy it. Can I, can I tell you something weird? No. It, yeah. Is it weird that I actually go to the theater to buy theater popcorn that I just turn around and walk out? But how can you get past the doors without buying a movie ticket? They just let you in. Why would they let you in? Would you go to buy the tickets at the kiosk? Yeah. So you tell them, I want to just get popcorn, and they let you in? No, you go into the theater where you go in and you buy tickets at a kiosk, like the automated the machine. Uh-huh. So it's right there. Okay, maybe the, the theaters I go to are right different there. because my, my theaters, you can't get to the popcorn buying area. Oh, no, right here? Until, until you, you pass the movie, the ticket wrapper. You have to pass the ticket wrapper, too. Nope. Over here, you mm-hmm. go in, you can get your ticket at the machine, Uh huh. and then the, it's in the same lobby as the concession stand. Oh, okay. No, the Music Box has that, I think, for oh, example. the Music Box Theater? Yeah, but, uh, big, but they're indie, and they have their own little d- different setup. But you probably could get away with buying just that be- without yeah, no, buying no, a no, ticket. No. It but works like everywhere a else, all the AMCs I go to, all of them, yeah, um, they're all, uh, you can't do that. Yeah, there's gatekeepers. Yeah, we call them here. It's the same lobby. So hmm. I just walk right in. Walk right up to the fucking counter. Popcorn, please. Wow. Put it halfway. Fill it halfway, you teenager, you. <laughs> then put butter. Uh-huh. Then fill it up the rest of the way. Add more butter. Wow. And then just douse it yeah. in that salt. Because I, I want my... So you want, want you put the salt on top. I to be as high, high as possible. You know? So you do... When you put the... When they, when, obviously, the salt on top, good idea. So when it's there and you get it, do you shake it? You don't shake. You tap. You tap the sides of the bag. You just tap? Okay. Tap, because then it makes the, ca- the, the, the salt cascade through the kernels mm-hmm. ever so gently. Ever and so it, gently. And it just, mm-hmm. the, the salt kisses the other kernels down below. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just fantastic. And I don't share any with my family. Of course not. Why would, I mean, you put the trouble to go there. Absolutely. <laughs> and talk to the one. teenagers and shit. Yeah. That's right. Right. So, yeah, I do that. That's very specific, Jay. I'm, I'm fucked. You know I got problems. I mean... As far as problems in the world go, I mean, it's not great, but it's not that bad. No, there's definitely other things worse in the world. Yes. That's the way I look at it. I mean, as far as habits and people's isms go, you know, strange things that they do. Yeah, isms. I mean, uh, it's worse than my dried mango thing, but (laughs) it's not as bad as feeling up children on on the way there or something, right? That 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 would be worse. See, that would be worse. worse. So, yeah, yeah, it's not quite. So, there you go. See, I don't feel bad. In the spectrum, you're okay. Great. Um, but otherwise, yeah, pretty weird. Mm-hmm. Very specific. And speaking of weird, have you had anything weird happen over the last two weeks since the, the so, of Sam episode? Uh, n- I mean, nothing weird. I mean, weird to me as in, um, does it happen to me very often, but I was sick. You were sick? Yeah, I'm, I'm very rarely sick. You were never sick, I was going to say. Yeah. So I was sick, um, I get sick maybe once a year. And for most of, it had been over a year. I think it's been like almost a year and a half, I think, since I've been sick. And I got a sinus infection. Mm. So it, it took me out of 
out of play, I guess, uh, for two days, two straight days. Um, yeah, it was two days, two nights. Um, and it did start the night before with like a throat thing, but I wasn't sure where it was going to go. So I still like worked that day, which is probably not good, but I didn't know where it was yet. Yeah. And then I had, uh, and I had a day off, and then I was going to work the next day, but obviously I was really into it by then. So my first call off in six years. Wow. Was that day. Look at you, employee. Yeah. The um, call off for actually being sick. I mean, um, I think I called off one other time for like a party when in my first year, but I, I think that's it. Do you remember that party, the, the bachelor party I took you to and you called off and then you got fired? Yeah. Yeah. What, what job was that? I, I clearly was, didn't care about it. I think it was that pizza place. Wasn't it the pizza place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I clearly didn't care. That was a good bachelor. Party. It, uh, yeah, if I if if I don't care, I'll I'll any excuse for me to leave. It's fine, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah and I'm not, I'm not saying that I super care about Starbucks, but obviously it's more important to me. Obviously, so I mean, I have I manage things better. There's my shift anyway. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, I do remember that now. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better. Glad yeah, I still have some phlegms, but otherwise I'm it's gone. Yeah, I went through the rounds of my house. Everyone has it or had it. It started off with my nephew, uh, Leo. Yeah, yeah, he's five and had it, and gave it to my youngest brother first. He was over it when I was getting it. My mom had it like three days before. Roth has it now. I just got over it now. Uh, it's been awful at the house. It's crazy you said it. it was the same exact thing here over the past two weeks. Yeah, no, uh, Katie was telling me. Katie was down for four. I didn't see her for four days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Why didn't you see her? She was just in bed. Uh-huh. Could not get out of bed. It was fantastic. It was terrible. <laughs> terrible. Is that a protein slip? Just terrible. <laughs> and then Nico caught it, of course. Yeah. Uh, but me and Talia, we pushed right through. We didn't get it, thank God. No? No, yeah. it's going to happen. Knock on wood. I mean, uh, that's fake wood. So, um, so are you sure you're not gonna get it? Is it really passed? No, yeah, we're done. We're yeah, done. everyone's on medication and everything's everything's good. Well, the thing is, I never take anything. So uh, those two days, I drank tea, which I never drink, and um, you know that's what I do. Yeah. My ritual. I am in bed more. I did sleep more, but man, I hate being at home. I still went out. <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> I still went out. I, get, I hate being home. It's crazy. I was watching, because um, I have guilty pleasures to watch when I'm sick. Like when I was in the hospital, for example, I watched, uh, you know, guilty pleasure shows. Like, I think that's when I, when I went, when I had surgery for pneumonia, not surgery for pneumonia, when I had pneumonia and that was nice of you, uh, when I was getting better, I binged all of Big Bang Theory, for example. Easy that to watch. Is, that is my hotel go-to. You told me that before. Yes. Big Bang Theory. Yeah, but my nowadays my go to whenever I have like a whenever I have to be in bed or I'm ill or I'm injured, usually injured because I'm more injured than ill. Um, I watch Gilmore Girls. Gilmore Girls, it's like so easy to watch. The mother on that show was scrumptious. I'm pretty sure she still is. Yeah, I forgot her name. Maybe less. Lauren Graham. Lauren Graham. Her real name, yeah. Mm. And the show is Laura Lie. But Coder and Chuck. Dude, I memorized that show. I could make a s'more out of if her. There, if we ever do, uh, if, you know how you know how those bars have those games where they oh, yeah, uh, trivia and bullshit. Trivia, yeah, you go yeah. trivia. Like if they do a Gilmore Girls night, that's it. I'm I'm acing that shit. <laughs> You're schooling everybody. I'm gonna ace that. Taking shit. them to the hole. Yeah, very few shows I know that well. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, crazy. Anyway, so that happened. That's weird for me. That is weird for you. Yeah, I bet I could beat it. Oh, I'm sure you can. What do you got? This is fuck. I don't know if I want to tell these stories because we got we got a crazy fucker to talk about tonight. I'm pretty sure that's every time. It's we're a here. real piece of work. This one. Yeah. So we're going to continue our serial killer heavy hitter theme, mm-hmm. uh, working towards these webs I'm spinning. Yeah. But I'll tell you, what's oh, that an idea for later? Sorry. I'll tell you though. Mm-hmm. Researching this guy, I don't know what it was. It, I think it really got in my head. Are you going to become a killer now? So no. So last week, during this week, it's Friday right now, it was Tuesday night. I was at a hotel, Mm -hmm. and I was in Jasper, Indiana. Ouch. Jasper, Indiana. I was at a Hilton Mm -hmm. property, and it was about 10 o'clock at night, and I'm sitting in my hotel room. All I have on is the desk lamp at at the little desk they give you in the hotels, and I'm on a chair. Chair has wheels on it, right? Just like any hotel. And I'm working on this episode. And I'm researching and I'm writing and I'm I'm really into what I'm doing, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I gotta hit a deadline. And I had my hoodie up. 
right? Yeah. And I'm mimicking it right now. No, he's not, folks. He's on his head right now. And I had my hoodie up like this. I'm sitting there, and I'm typing away, and I'm doing research. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, from the doorway <laughs> of this hotel room, yeah. this big black mass rushed at me. Whoa. And I caught it out of the corner of my eye, and it was big. And I spun in my chair, and I kicked my feet on the floor. like to, I pushed myself back like to defend myself. Yeah. Fucking, obviously, there was nothing there. Yeah. Nothing there. Wow. I was there for two nights. Couldn't sleep a wink either night. <laughs> Up at all hours of the night, pacing the hotel room, going into the bathroom, walking between the beds, checking my phone. Could not sleep for those two nights. Something, wow. I don't know what it was. And usually I could knock out at a hotel because I don't have all the subconscious things going on in my mind like I do when I'm at home. You know, my wife Ooh. is hard of hearing. So ever since my first child was born 10 years ago, I always had to be the one at night to hear things, mm -hmm. a baby crying or the baby, you know, so I could let Katie know and, you know, cause she can't hear very well, especially when she's sleeping. So when I'm at home, I don't sleep well. Cause I think that subliminal thing, I'm always listening. Cause I'm the, I'm the only, I'm the one who's going to hear it. Yeah. Right. Um, so usually when I'm in a hotel, I don't have to worry about that. So I can knock out pretty decently. But this time, that black mass, I don't know if there was something in that room. I don't know if I was channeling something because I was so focused on this piece of shit we're going to talk about tonight, this crazy fucker. But I'm telling you, man, there was something in that, in that hotel room. Hmm. It was crazy. Or it was my Mr. Lincoln, someone we haven't talked about in probably over a year, the reason why we started this podcast, right? Yeah. The Mr. Lincoln Report. Yeah. Haven't seen him in ages, well over a year. Maybe that was him. I don't know. But it scared the shit out of me. Do you think it kept, so uh, I guess my question is, uh, do you think this energy entity, what have you, that bum rushed you, um, kept you up or your fear of seeing it again kept you up? Like fear of putting your defenses down kept you up? I think there was, I think there was something with that hotel room and I think something there was keeping me awake. Because I would say that. I really do. Personally, me, if that were to happen to me, I'm not saying that, oh, I'm going to be stoic and I freak out. That first night, probably would stay up. For sure. But the second night I wouldn't. I'll tell you. Fall asleep. After, it, after it happened and I went to bed and all that, I wasn't, I wasn't scared anymore. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was just fear keeping me awake. Okay. Because I was walking around, I mean, like nothing, you know, like nothing. I wasn't scared mm -hmm. any longer. So I think it was something in that room that might have been keeping me awake. Yeah. Maybe the, in the Honestly, energy. Yeah. Um, and, hmm. Oh, go ahead. No, no, nothing. Sorry. And then when I got back home... Sunday, Friday, I'm getting my day screwed up. Today's Friday, last night. I, I was sleeping. I was still researching, trying to finish things up. While you were sleeping? Wow, you're really a multitasker. Yeah, this just happened last night. I was sleeping. It, first, I was doing all the research. Everyone went to bed. I'm doing my research. I'm scripting the episode out. Yeah. Because so you were coming, I, you know, today. I went to bed. It was probably 2 o'clock in the morning. Fall asleep. I don't know what time it was because we have no clocks in our room. Uh, everything is pitch black. We have a TV in there. We put like clothes in front of the little TV logo so it doesn't glow at night. I mean, we want it black. We have black curtains, black. I mean, curtains. I know you. You don't yes. like any sensory you, sensory distractions, right? I, I want like a tomb in there. My you wife, you and Joe are very similar my wife's that way. The same way. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. For me, I can sleep in my car in the middle of the day. <laughs> so I can't do it. Yeah. So I don't know what time it was, but all of a sudden, I was awoken with this paralyzing fear that someone was in the house. There was someone in the house. Hmm. There was someone in the fucking house. And at the same time, I woke up, and I, I have this thought in my mind that there's somebody in the house in our bedroom <laughs> Did you ever hear David Bowie's Black Star song? I uh, can't say that I have. It is, it's a great song, but it is probably the creepiest song you'll ever hear in your life. Hmm. It's great, but it is a frightening song. David Bowie is a, a, a character. I love David Bowie. That song, Black Star, was blasting in our bedroom to a deafening decibel 
What? And I'm laying on my stomach, right? Uh-huh. And I, I can't move. I, I, I want to move because there's someone in the house. There's someone in the fucking house. And this song is blasting. Hmm. It, louder than I've ever heard anything. Right? Okay. But then I look at Katie. I'm laying on my stomach. I'm facing her. I look at Katie. She's dead asleep. The kid's dead silent. Right. She, she's deaf or not that deaf. Right. She, she has partial hearing loss in both ears, but the despo this song was, and it was just, it was kind of a chorus of this song. Okay. Oscar, wait, could we, could we play the clip from Black Star that I heard throughout the room? What, you think I'm going to find it right now and play it? Yeah, could we do that? I guess. All right, just loop it real quick. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's what was blasting through the house, okay? Okay. But it wasn't. Obviously not, yeah. It was just because we listened on our Alexa in the bedroom, we listened to ocean sounds at night. Mm-hmm. That's what was really playing. Because if the song was playing at the decibel, I, I heard it, everyone would have woke up in the house. That's how fucking loud it was in my mind. That's crazy. And I mm. literally thought I was going to die from fear because someone was coming. They were in the house. They were coming upstairs. And you couldn't house. move. Could not move. So you were having a paralyzing... I really think so. Yeah. I've never had sleep paralysis before. There you go. I think it was that my experience of sleep paralysis. But I think the most, I think the most horrible thing was I couldn't get out of bed to go check on the kids. Yeah. In my mind, there was someone in the house. They were coming up to kill us, and I couldn't go take care of my kids. Imagine what that feels like to a father, right, being paralyzed in the stomach, being woken up to this black star, uh, um, what do you call it, refrain? Yeah, sure. Blasting through the house, but it's not blasting through the house. It was in my head. Yeah. And it was it was just terrifying. And I think it all comes from doing research on this fucking guy we're going to talk about You think tonight. it's connected to your hotel experience? I don't think so. Or mo- I don't hotel, think motel. so. The only common yeah. theme is before these things happened, I was researching this guy. I'm going to get that song right. That we're going to talk about. So that happened to me. Stuff like that hasn't happened to me in a very, very long time. And uh, I don't think I've ever had sleep paralysis before. But if that's what it is, that's what that was. It sounds like it is. I never want to have it again in my life. I, mean, I literally thought I was going to die. Yeah. I mean, that's how it is. But, you, but it's not a dream. You were awake. I swear to God I was. Yeah. Did you wake up, uh, Katie? No. No? I, I tell you, I couldn't. No, I mean, after, like, it had to pass. No. After so I just, wo- then I woke up and the sun was out. So like it was crazy. Hmm. I don't know. So I guess you don't know for sure if it was a dream or not. Because dreams feel real, right? So yeah, I, <laughs> like yeah, I guess. I mean, I would I would put my life on the line that I was wide awake, but okay. it was just all in my head. I don't know. But the common theme between Jasper and Deanna Hilton and what happened to me last night hmm. was researching this asshole. So I don't know if I'm channeling this guy or, or what the fuck. Well, he's channeling you. Yeah. So. Okay. I don't know. Not so, much to say about I that. mean, so I got a sinus infection, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, listeners, let us know what you think about that. Contact at ChicagoGhostPodcast.com. Was it sleep paralysis or was I channeling something? I don't know. I want to jump into the episode. I'd like to uh, run down the housekeeping. It was actually a, a really busy week for us as far as listener feedback is concerned. Mm-hmm. We have three pieces of feedback, yeah. which is awesome. Three in two weeks. That's, that's, a, good, that's a record for us, I think. So uh, get, a hold of self, uh, get a, a hold of us on Twitter. And get a hold of yourself, too. <laughs> at Chicago Ghost Podcast. Sorry, scratch that. At Chicago Ghosts <laughs> on Twitter. You think I'd get this by now. At Chicago Ghosts on Twitter. We had a Twitter review. And it was really funny. So if listeners remember last podcast, the Son of Sam episode, um, we read a Facebook review from, from Carrie Smith Montgomery. Um, and in, in the past two weeks, I, I think it's her daughter. Because um, if you remember from Carrie's, Review 
She said that she turned her I'm daughter. I'm so drunk, but I don't remember shit. <laughs> she turned her daughter and her fiancé onto the the podcast, right? Mm-hmm. And they all listen religiously. So the daughter's fiancé or her own fiancé? Her own fiancé. Okay. C- Carrie's fiancé, yes. So on Twitter, when the Son of Sam released, uh, I got a, a message, a tweet. A tweet, I don't yes. Know what to say what to I mean, you're aging yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so from, from Carrie's daughter on Twitter, at Jess underscore report, at Jess underscore report, she goes, um, me listening to the latest episode of Sh- At Chicago Ghost, the podcast, in a very public library shouting, that's my mama, at full volume as they read her review. Aww. And then she went on to say, we're all huge fans. You guys are great. Keep up the awesome work. So I thought that was really cute. I thought that was funny. You know, you created a cycle. So uh, A cycle? A cycle. Oh, a cycle. Like bicycle minus the bi. Got it. Um, so uh, the mother is going to listen to this episode. And in the middle of her work, oh. she's going to say, that's my girl. That's my and then daughter. we're going to talk about it the next time, and then the daughter will do it again and we'll at another public like says, right, we'll be, right, and then we'll all die. It'll be like a Russian doll episode again. Oh, my God. So, just saying. Well, here's a public service announcement, a PSA from the Supernatural Current Studies podcast. Mm-hmm. Listeners, don't do anything in the name of the podcast that's going to get you kicked out of school or work. Yes. But keep listening. Right. And keep spreading the love. So that was nice, right? Yes, yeah, that's, that's hella nice. Thank you, at Jess underscore report. Um, contact us on, what are we contacting on now? Uh, Instagram, at Chicago Ghosts. Mm-hmm. At Chicago Ghosts on Instagram. Uh, Facebook, at Chicago Ghost Podcast. At Chicago Ghost Podcast. Contact at Chicago Ghost Podcast dot com. Send us emails, send us your thoughts. And dot org now. Oh, okay. Uh, our website, of course, is chicagoghostpodcast.com. Oscar, we're on YouTube. Surprise. No, that's good. Supernatural Occurrence Studies on YouTube. Yeah, don't. Listeners, go check it out. There's a lot of stuff there, a lot of content. A lot of ads, too. A lot of ads. <laughs> <laughs> While you're there, subscribe, like something, ring the bell so you're updated every time we upload new content. You can support us on Patreon if you love what we do and you want us to do more. Patreon.com slash Supernatural, a current studies podcast. If you don't want to help us out on, on, on Patreon, you could always leave us an iTunes review. You could do it right off your phone, what you're probably listening to our voices on right now. Your cell phones mm-hmm. rate us on iTunes. Do you like iTunes ratings, Oscar? I mean, I can't use them like at, uh, to get credit from the bank or anything, but yeah, no. I like them. But it helps other listeners... Find us? Find us. Yeah. Which helps us attract ad revenue. Yeah, and we are in the podcasting age. That's right. Getting more listeners. So help us support our passion project. Leave us some iTunes reviews. We got an iTunes review last week. Oh, we did? This is great. Yeah. It's from Steve Forever 4. And he said, holy crap, I'm hooked. Five stars. Everyone who is interested in the paranormal needs to subscribe. I am a new listener from Northern California and have already started spreading the word about these guys out here. The topics are interesting, but the best thing about this podcast is definitely the chemistry between the hosts. It's pure poetry. They all have different views, ideas, and thoughts. They let the listener make their own opinions and not just be biased to their own. Hope you guys come to Bay Area, Northern Cali. It would be awesome to tell you about some awesome spots here and tell you about a couple of strange instances I have experienced myself out here. Ooh, should go visit them. Oh, Steve Forever 4, I could tell you. Um, over the summer when we went on our, our Haunted Ohio uh, odyssey, it was between California and Ohio. Hmm. I was really pulling for California. I wanted our podcast trip to be there, but I was outvoted. I mean, it's a democracy. So uh, and wait, First of all, we I don't remember being asked. I thought we did. No. You guys just said Ohio. What would you have voted for? Probably California, because at the time I would have said, who the fuck cares about Ohio? (laughs) But. (laughs) About, right, of course. Ohio, what? We turned out to to be be pretty cool. But Steve Forever 4, we were. Although a lot of white people. to get there. Maybe next, maybe this summer. Yeah. We'll come to to Cali and we'll come check out these uh, haunted places up in Northern California. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the iTunes reviews. Uh, review listeners, we need we need more just like that. So what do you say? Help us out. 
Yeah, just play your ice Steve Forever 4. <laughs> you could call or text us anytime at what area code, Oscar? Um, uh, Chicago. 911. <laughs> Chicago area code right. 872-529-0767. 872 872- Five two nine zero seven six seven. Leave us a message. Send us a text. We'll read it, play it on the show, guaranteed. Um, this this voicemail, this next voicemail, this could be you. Hi, uh, my name's Jim. I'm from uh, Palos Heights, Illinois. I uh, just got a couple things for you guys. Uh, first of all, I think you guys are doing a great job with the podcast. Uh, been listening to it for about a year now. Um, just getting caught up. I started from uh, day one from the first podcast, and uh, which brings me to the second thing I'm calling about, which um, is I just listened to the Resurrection Mary uh, podcast you guys put on a few weeks ago or a couple months ago now, and uh, you know I just had a comment. You know, you kind of like we're debunking it and stuff, and you know I just can't stop thinking what you know. Um, you know, what, it, what was made of all these, you know, reports, you know, the eyewitness reports, you know, you got credible witnesses that are saying they had seen these, you know, you know, occurrences where, you know, they've actually reported them to the Justice Police Department. Now, these aren't like a bunch of teenage kids either. I mean, we're talking, you know, clergy members, nurses, uh, you know, from all walks of life over the, you know, some of maybe 25 years. So, and, you know, these people don't have anything to gain from it. So, I don't know, as far as saying it's an urban legend, I think it separates it, you know, the uh, Resurrection Mary portion, you know, separates it from, you know, other, you know, cities that have the hitchhiking ghosts because, you know, you have credible witnesses who have seen this. Now, either they're crazy or they're making it up. And I can't see, you know, people, you know, law enforcement. I think there were some sheriffs, you know, police that have seen this and, you know, um, you know, but anyway, I just thought I'd comment on that because, you know, you're kind of, you were kind of like trying to debunk it and it just didn't make a whole lot of sense because like I said, these, these witnesses, you know, were credible. They don't have anything to gain other than, you know, being ridiculed by their, you know, people they work with and friends saying you're nuts. You're just making this stuff up. But anyway, I just thought I'd point that out. Um, anyway, I think you guys are doing a great job. Jason, you do a great job with researching the topics and that, and Oscar is always interesting and funny. So I'll continue to listen, and uh, hopefully, you know, I really like the local stuff. So uh, keep up the good work. I'll talk to you. Thanks. Well, that's a that's a good voicemail right there. Yeah, that's uh yeah, it's funny because um when he mentions it, like oh yeah, we I guess we did talk about that, and obviously I added the goddamn thing, but uh, I don't um. I wasn't there to dissuade anything. I didn't wasn't there to debunk anything, which is funny. But he didn't talk about it. Yeah, Dave, Dave, Dave. Right. I remember so, we talked about it. I just don't remember me personally like aiming for that or thinking that it was an urban legend. But then again, I never really like, looked at urban legends as a thing. Yeah. In my head, yeah. I mean, you were asking me off air, what's an urban legend? Like specifically, yeah. I meant like I know what they are, and I've seen the awful movie. But like, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, yeah. you know, two things. One, Jim, thank you so much for leaving the voicemail. This is the type of interaction we love to have with listeners. I think it takes balls to call a show and offer a critique. Yeah, he probably has uh, two of it's, them. It's really the first critique we received. And I said, if it's if it's good, bad, remember, that's a term I use. If it's good, bad, we'll play it. And I don't even think it was bad, but I think yeah. it takes balls to call. So thank you so much for caring enough to reach out and express your opinion about a particular podcast episode. Um, and number two... He's right. He's right. Yeah. I I let Dave Black sway the way I attacked that show. Yeah. Dave started the first interview we had mm-hmm. with well we're investigating this like it's a it's an urban legend. And I remember uh before I don't know who was on the recording, but we talked about how we were gonna approach talking to people in the cemetery that way because uh we didn't want them to immediately kick us out or immediately start. Is that like, what it was? Yeah. I remember we talked about how we were going to talk about it as not as like um, 
people glorifying it or fans of uh, Resurrection Mary, but we're going to go in there trying to debunk it so people will be open to talk, to talk about something that they must hate to talk about. I think I remember that conversation as well, but... I don't think it was on the show, though. I stuck in the vein of mm-hmm. this being an urban, an urban legend. Mm-hmm. Because, again, Jim's right. Well, it, first, it shows how strongly... The voicemail shows how strongly Chicagoans have adopted Resurrection Mary. Definitely. And they're ready to fight for her. Yeah. And, and I think we talked about that in that episode, how part of Chicago lore Resurrection Mary is. I mean, mm-hmm. you think of Chicago, it's, it's Al Capone, the Cubs, Resurrection Mary, you know, and murder in politics. But that just goes to show you how strongly Chicagoans have adopted. And he's also right with all the witnesses. Resurrection Mary is the most cited hitchhiking ghost, I think, in the world, with the most substantiated, verified uh, witnesses, sightings, yeah. period. So there's got to be something to that. Yeah. Just like he said in his voicemail, yeah, I definitely not everyone's have, a liar. I definitely wouldn't have called it an urban legend. Yeah. And, yeah. and as the host, I probably should have been better at... Yeah, but we never said those words at the time either. So Not sticking we didn't... in Dave's vein of yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. of of urban legend because I really do think there's That's something there. Yeah, I really do. So again, Jim, thank you so much for for leaving the voicemail and for caring enough to comment. Um, we hope you stick around as a listener and and we keep you entertained. Are you not entertained? <laughs> what movie is that from? Uh, that movie with the face, you know. Oh, oh with the faces. Yeah, that's right. Those faces. They had acting. t-shirts on. I think they <laughs> no, actually, they didn't. They have Roman hair. gladiator stuff. Oh. That chainmail. All right. Well, let's take a break because uh, we'll listen to a sponsor because we got a lot of stuff to get through. We have a real sick bastard to talk about. Sick. Uh, and fuck. I think this guy's fucking haunting me. So, well, let's see what commercial Oscar is going to play. <clears throat> Today's episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast is brought to you by LootCrate.com. LootCrate, totally rat swag from your favorite movie, television, and video game franchises delivered conveniently to your front door. That's Marvel, Far Cry, Rick and Morty, Batman, WWE, Harry Potter, anime, Minecraft, Stranger Things, and a whole lot more, guys. Visit TryLootCrate.com forward slash SOS dash radio and enter promo code BRIDGE10 to receive 10% off any new subscription. That's trylucrate.com forward slash SOS dash radio and enter promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% off any new subscription to Lucrate. Your order must be placed, however, before 9 p.m. Pacific time on or before the 19th of the month to secure your special listener offer. That's trylucrate.com forward slash SOS dash radio and enter promo code, what's that, guys? BRIDGE10. Welcome back, listeners. Please visit our sponsors to help support the show. We would love it. Love it. Mm. All right. Well, the lights are turned down low. Mm. The ceremonial candle is lit. And almost blows up. And the drinks are flowing. Let's start this episode. Now, a lot of the information I compiled for this episode comes from a 2011 article from Texas Monthly, published on TexasMonthly.com in 2012, called The Lost Boys. Other sources I used included Wikipedia and various newspaper stories from the time. And this is a warning, listeners. This is a sad, sick episode, just like our Gacy episode. The enormous loss of life. The dreams never fulfilled, the children never born, the families never started, victims' families destroyed. It's just terrible. David, this entire story of sadistic homosexual slayings would almost appear to be fiction, scripted with the full intention of shocking readers over and over again. 
It's that hard to believe. So many lives involved, so many killed over such a long period of time, and all of it going undetected. But it's not fiction. It's very real. A deadly conspiracy now listed as one of the most horrifying crimes in this century. An innocent-looking Pasadena home, but some of the people who went in were carried out in plastic bags. They had been murdered. Death in most cases came after the victims had been subjected to various sex acts and torture. The victims were all boys in the early to mid-teens who allegedly had been lured into a death trap by this young man, 17-year-old Elmer Wayne Henley. It was Henley who unveiled this secret of mass killings and led police to the graves of the dead. Henley called the police to the home of Dean Coral. He said he killed that Pasadena resident. Henley said the 34-year-old Coral had talked about killing several young men and burying them in this boat storage in South Houston. The Candyman was a Houston, Texas-based serial killer, responsible for killing at least 28 boys and young men between 1970 and in 1973. His real name was Dean Arnold Coral, also known as the Candyman, also known as the Pied Piper, and his murders are collectively called the Houston Mass Murders. Hmm. And the Candyman operated with two accomplices named David Owen Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley. A lot of three names there. Yes. Remember the three name thing? Three yeah. exactly. And I'm glad you mentioned name. This fucking guy's name, Coral, that's mm-hmm. C O R L L. Yeah. I fucking hate that name. It's like an affront to my to my intelligence. Those three <laughs> consonants in a row at the end of his name yeah. drive me absolutely crazy. You should stay away from certain languages then. So I'm not saying coral as the stuff in the sea. Right. Right. Coral. You, yeah, I wish you guys could see Jay. Jay's pained expression. Uh, it's hilarious. Coral. It's <laughs> disgusting. This fucking name drives me nuts. So it's C-O-R-L-L. That's what I'm saying, listeners. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, the crazy thing is, the Dean Coral Candyman murders are nearly forgotten about today. No one talks about or even knows about it. Kind of like the Ripper crew we covered back in episode fifty six. Yeah, it's kind of like they won't have a, they won't have the the Cor- Dean Coral you know tapes at the Netflix special. No, there you are know? movies. There are movies. Oh, there are movies. You can look it up right now. I didn't put the movies in my notes, but hmm. there there are definitely movies about this and documentaries about this. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm saying like not like a big one that everyone's talking about, but if there yeah, is, not like a massive right. blockbuster or anything. Not like the Zodiac or you know Summer of Sam or anything, or even the the Netflix Gacy series or anything. Nothing really that popular. But and the reason is at the time of the Candyman murders, very few photographs were available of Dean Coral, except for a few grainy black and white ones. And Coral never gave interviews. And you'll understand why later in the episode. So the public instead focused on more media accessible murderers like Ted Bundy, David Berkowitz, and John Wayne Gacy. And of course, Gacy and Berkowitz we covered in Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast episodes 86 and 87. So the Coral murders were largely forgotten. And today, people living in the area of Houston where all this took place They think the murders and the murderers are just an urban legend. But those who haven't forgotten are the remaining parents of Coral's victims, who to this day contact local authorities whenever a body turns up, inquiring as to whether or not it's their missing son. Hmm. Now, as we like to do, let's get into the killer's background and see where this monster came from. So Dean Coral was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana. On December twenty fourth, nineteen thirty nine, that's all I explained. Christmas Eve baby. His father was Arnold Edward Coral, an Air Forceman, and his mother was named Mary Robinson, and he had a younger brother named Stanley. At the age of seven, Dean Coral suffered an undiagnosed case of rheumatic fever, which went undiagnosed until nineteen fifty, which left him with a heart uh, murmur. And I couldn't find any indication of violence, or sexual abuse, or head injuries, or killing animals, or starting fires Mm -hmm. in Coral's childhood. 
A few articles mention that his father, Arnold, was strict, uh, sometimes doling out, har- doling out harsh punishments for small infractions, but consider the times. Every kid got his ass whipped back in, back in the day, you know? At least more than today. More than today, absolutely. Definitely. Teachers and friends describe young Ding Quarrel as a shy, introspective, and serious child that got decent grades, seldom socialized with other kids, both in grammar school and high school, but he did show concern for others. He wasn't like a sociopath. It sounds like me. Right. Kind of like our Oscar here, yes. Hmm. So and far. He, and he loved his mama. He was definitely a mama's boy. Oh, no, no. <laughs> At home, Coral's father and mother fought a lot and eventually divorced, then remarried again, and eventually divorced again. Wow. Mother Mary took custody of the kids, and they remained in contact with their father. Again, nothing too terrible. As far as broken homes go, they're worse. Exactly. I mean, how many... I'm from a broken home. Oh, you you are? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, Coral was drafted in the U.S. Army in 1964 and was stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana, then Fort Benning, Georgia, where he learned to be a radio repairman, before being transferred to his final stop, Fort Hood, Texas. By all accounts, Coral's military record was perfect, no issues, but he hated the military, and he was discharged in 1956 on a hardship, stating that his mother needed him back home to help run the family business. When oh. he that. Now, when he came out of the army, Coral did tell some friends that while he was enlisted, while he was in, he discovered his homosexual feelings and oh. hinted that he had homosexual encounters with other servicemen. And after he got out, friends noticed a change in Coral's behavior whenever he was around teenage boys. Hmm. It's almost like he became, like, how old was he at this time, would you say? He was um, born in what year again? In the military, he I had keep doing to this be to you. early 20s. Because uh, maybe he's having his, early like... Late, early, early, very early 20s. His, like, his sexual awakening... Because you know how for teenagers they can't control their hormones, kind of thing, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And they are horny all the time, or they are thinking about it all the time, right, and things like that. Oh yeah. Um, maybe he just got his a little later, and because of what he discovered, he wants right it's possible. his desires back in the um, his military time. Yeah. It could be a sexual awakening gone bad, obviously. But I'm saying Go, gone very bad. Yeah, but I'm saying you know like that. Yeah. Now, I guess, I guess the only weird thing in Coral's background was the fact that his mother married and divorced a lot. Right? Yeah. She married and divorced Dean's father twice. Yeah. Then she married a traveling clock salesman <laughs> named Jake West. That's like a superhero name. Yeah, it and is. And a clock salesman. They, they had things like that back then. Yeah. And then she married a merchant marine who she was matched with by a rudimentary Houston-based computer dating service. It was very nice. crazy. Now, eventually, a psychic told Mother Mary that she needed to get as far away from her merchant marine husband as possible. So she divorced him, Mm. closed the family business, and hightailed it to Colorado. Her son, Dean, however, decided to stay in Texas, and that's when the carnage began. But before we get into all that, in 1962, the Coral family moved to Houston, Texas, to an area uh, located four miles outside of, four miles north of downtown Houston. Mm -hmm. So Dean's mother could open a candy factory called the Coral Candy Factory. The area they moved to was a place called Houston Heights. It was um, like a residential industrial area. And at the time, Houston Heights was described as a decrepit and tired location and considered to be a low-income area. Hmm. So you got to keep that in mind as we go through this story. Anyway, I I know you're what's that? I think I already know where you're going to go, but yeah, continue. Okay, yeah, because yeah. <clears throat> I think this is really the location where a lot of... The, uh, all right, well, we'll just let it unfold. This is very opportune-driven. Like, opportunities kept coming up to, like, it seems like it will be there for him to be this person. Right, so a lot of broken homes, mm-hmm. a lot of, you know, dirty blue collar. Let's imagine the mother leaving uh, at that time. Well, yeah, Dean, his mother hightailed it. Yeah, yeah. now he's alone. But mm-hmm. So I'm kind of backtracking here. Sorry. So we know that his mother takes off. Mm-hmm. Dean stays behind. Now I'm kind of backtracking to catch you up. How yeah, yeah. wound up in this area. 
So the Coral Candy Factory specialized in candies called Divinity, which I had to look up. It's actually a chewy vanilla pecan candy, which sounds fucking fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Pralines and pecan chewies. (laughs) Now, Dean uh, ran the assembly line at Coral Candy Factory, and he was vice president of the company. And his brother, Stanley, was secretary treasurer. And that's really all you hear about Stanley. You can't find anything about Stanley Quarrel. Anything. Mm. Anywhere. Mm. Um, Now, in his free time, Dean Quarrel handed out large samples of candy to children. And conveniently, the Quarrel Candy Factory was located across the street from an elementary school. This fact earned Quarrel the nicknames the Candyman and the Pied Piper. He would invite kids to a back room at the candy factory that was outfitted with a pool table for neighborhood and kid, neighborhood kids and employees to enjoy. He fitted his white delivery van with cushions, carpet, and a television so he could comfortably take neighborhood kids on picnics to the beach. He gave kids rides on his motorcycle and even employed neighborhood kids and their parents at the Coral Candy Factory. Well, and neighbors thought Dean Coral was great, just a perfect gentleman. And his mother described him as loyal, obedient, helpful, loving, and an all-around good, normal boy. The only problem Dean Coral had in his mother's eyes was the fact that because he had seen so many broken marriages, he refused to let anyone get close to him. Hmm. That's it. That's all his mother thought was wrong with him. Yeah. So anyway, after Dean's mother left her merchant marine husband, closed the candy factory, and headed to Colorado, and Coral decided to stay behind, Dean Coral moved from Houston Heights and got an apartment in a very up-and-coming part of Houston, filled with young, single people, and less than a mile, in fact, from where a well-known Houston bachelor named George W. Bush was living and gallivanting. So that's kind of, I mean, this was a very affluent... Up and coming. I should tell you everything that right he moved there. to. Yeah, right. Exactly. And this guy did a lot of moving. It's like if I lived in Michael Jordan's neighborhood or something. Right. Kind of like, like that. Like I don't have to say how rich it is. Was it just Lake knowing Forest? That. Lake Forest, Illinois. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Coral did a lot of moving. I could not write down every single home apartment that You're he kidding. rented and where killings took place. It's impossible. Really? That many? Yeah. Very transient. Very wow. transient. Wow. Now, it was while he was living in this hip part of Houston. That Dean Coral, Dean Coral began in, see, I hate his fucking name. <laughs> Dean Coral began indulging his fantasy, the secret he had been hiding for years, his lust for young men. Coral would often invite young men over to his apartment to drink and do drugs, and one of those young men was 15-year-old David Owen Brooks. Now, Coral knew Brooks since he was about 10 or 11 years old. Brooks was 10 or 11 years old mm-hmm. from the candy factory. You see, David Brooks, he was described as a sickly child that wore hippie-looking glasses, real nerdy kind of kid. And Brooks' father, he was a paving contractor, a real rough-and-tumble son of a bitch, and he would pick on his son. He seen his son as an embarrassment and called him a sissy. Hmm. So, Brooks would escape to the Coral Candy Factory and hang out with the much older Dean Coral. There was a 15-year difference between them. To get away from his father... And later, Brooks and Dean Coral, Brooks said Dean Coral was the only adult who didn't make fun of him or make him feel inferior. So Brooks grew to idolize the candy man and even looked to him as a father figure. Now, fast forward to when Dean Coral had his own apartment. One day, Dean invited Brooks over, then convinced the teen to pull his pants down and allow Coral to blow him. And this really kind of completed the indoctrination of Brooks. In fact, it came out later that by the age of 12, Brooks was receiving cash and gifts from Coral whenever Brooks would allow Coral to blow him. Then, on or around December 13th, 1970, David Brooks walked into Dean Coral's apartment and found two naked boys tied to Coral's bed. Coral was naked too and molesting the boys. Brooks did an immediate about face and left the apartment. Later, when Brooks questioned Coral as to what the hell he had walked in on, Coral told him that he was part of a gay pornography ring 
and that he gets paid to send boys to California, California to pose for photos. Hmm. According to Brooks, sometime le- later, Coral changed his story and said that he didn't send the boys to California to be photographed. Instead, he killed them and buried them in a boat shed. Now, here's where we're going to get into all the murders. Again, this is going to be this is going to be nasty stuff. If you're sensitive, turn back now. As we go through the victim list, I want you to keep in mind that Coral was known for and got off on doing the following to his victims. Victims as young as 13 years old. He liked to rip out his victims' pubic hair one by one. He brutally raped his victims, sometimes for days, with, the, with either his own member or large rubber instruments, while the victims were handcuffed or tied to a large wooden board. He liked to insert thin glass rods into his victim's penis, then either shatter the rod or snap it off. He liked to castrate victims, cut off their genitals. And there was penis chewing sometime until the penis turned to mush. All this while Cole's victims were alive. Then he would kill them, either by strangulation or shooting. So let's get into the murders. This list is unfortunately long, and as I said, it's gruesome. Now, it's believed that the two boys David Brooks walked in on on that very first time were Jimmy Glass and Danny Yates, both 14 years old, who disappeared while attending an anti-drug youth rally and worship service at a church called the Evangelical Temple. According to Jimmy Glass's brother, Willie, he watched the two teens get up during the service, like they were heading to the bathroom. And that was it. They vanished. Both were later found in a common grave in Dean Coral's boat shed, and more on this shed later. Yeah. On September 25th, 1970, 18-year-old Jeffrey Conan, a University of Austin, University of Texas at Austin student, disappeared while hitchhiking from Austin to Houston. Turns out, Coral picked him up and strangled the young man, then buried his body at High Island in the Bolivar Peninsula in Galveston County. His body was found under a large boulder, naked, wrapped in plastic, and covered in a layer of lime. Conan was found bound, hand and foot, suggesting he had also been raped. In 1971, and after moving from the apartment where Coral had had the naked boys tied up, he struck again. This time, however, Coral had his minion David Brooks as an accomplice. On January 30th, 1971, Coral and Brooks spotted two boys in Houston Heights, 15-year-old Donald Waldrop and his 13-year-old brother, Jerry. The boys were walking to a bowling alley when they were picked up by Coral and Brooks and brought back to Coral's new apartment, where Brooks said he witnessed Coral strangle to death both boys. After filling out missing persons report on both boys, the Waldrop boys were listed as runaways, and their disappearance was not investigated. Even though family members insisted this was not the case, they were not runaways. The brothers were later found in a common grave inside Coral's boat shed. And for his loyalty, on not ratting on Coral for killing the brothers, Coral gave David Brooks a green Corvette for his birthday. Oh my God. On March 9th, 1971, Coral and Brooks spotted Brooks' good friend, 15-year-old Randell Harvey, while he was riding his bike to work at a gas station. It's very likely Brooks convinced Randell Harvey to ride with them, and the trio wound up back at Coral's apartment. Once there, Coral raped and tortured Harvey, then shot him in the head. Coral and Brooks both took Harvey's body to the boat shed. Two months later, on May 29, 1971, Dean Coral and David Brooks abducted two boys while they were walking to a swimming pool on the north side of Houston Heights. 16-year-old Gregory Winkle and 13-year-old 
David Hillegeist. Both were last seen getting into a white van. Gregory Winkle worked at the Coral Candy Factory when he was very young, and so did his mother. And Hillegeist would hang out at the candy store, at the candy factory, until his mother forced him to come home. He loved it there. So this sick fucker, Dean Coral, knew these two boys very well, and likely David Brooks did too. Therefore, getting these two poor, unsuspecting boys into Coral's van was probably the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. And again, they all wound up back at Coral's apartment. And once again, both were strangled, and their bodies brought to Coral's boat shed. Now, before killing the boys, Winkle was forced to call his mother and tell her he was out of town at a beach swimming with friends. When he didn't return home, a missing persons port was filed. But because the phone call was made, police classified both Winkle and Hillegeist as runaways. So the parents were left fending for themselves. And this is a theme that came up again and again. Lots of missing boys from Houston Heights all being classified as runaways with little to no police involvement. Anyway, hundreds of missing posters went up for both Winkle and Hillegeist, as well as a, of an offer of a $1,000 reward for information to their whereabouts. Yeah. Enough money was scraped together by both families to hire a private investigator who said that likely the boys were abducted by a man nicknamed Chicken Joe. Huh. who supposedly provided male prostitutes to gay clients. As time went on, the police were notified that Gregory Winkle had a friend that drove a Plymouth GTX, and that the same car was seen driving through the area when the teens went missing, a GTX with license plate TMF724. If police would have just investigated this information, instead of just assuming the boys were runaways they would have found that the car belonged to Dean Coral. Hmm. Now, a lot of neighbors turned out to help search for David Hillegeist and Mally Winkle. One of the people that offered to help was David Brooks' friend, another 15-year-old named Elmer Wayne Henley Jr. Henley, like Brooks, suffered at the hand of his father, who repeatedly and regularly beat his wife and kids. But unlike Brooks, who was described as, you know, shy and sickly, kind of nerdy, Henley was kind of gregarious, a wild child, drinking, smoking pot, chasing girls. Rebelling, yeah. Yeah. When Brooks eventually introduced Henley to Dean Coral about early 1971, as an intended victim, Brooks was luring Henley to Coral to kill. Instead, Coral was impressed with Henley. And Henley, in turn, was impressed with Coral. So Coral decided to not kill Henley. Instead, he decided to use him. Now, later on, Henry, Henley told investigators that Coral was a smart, clean-cut, nicely-dressed man who listened to him and explained things to him. And Henley said it was important for Coral to like him. Henley also insists that when he offered to help the Hillegeist and Winkle families search for their missing sons, he had no idea it was Coral who was behind it. He just wanted to help because he knew the boys and he had been friendly with them. Right. Now, I think it's important to understand Brooks's and Henley's mindsets at the time so we could understand how two fairly innocent teenagers were swayed to follow Coral into the abyss. And at this point, all Henley knew was what Coral told him which was that he, Coral, was part of an organized gay pornography ring out of California, and that Henley would get paid $200 for every boy he brought to Coral. Wow. And Henley kind of seemed excited, they say, to, to be part of this kind of covert operation. So he was into it. Yeah. But he wasn't photographing. He was killing. Yeah. And Coral was. And as far as we know, they were not involved in the murders, and they didn't know about them. <laughs> That's what they say, right? We'll see, right? Yeah. We'll see how it falls out. So now the, the, the killer trio is complete. Henley and Brooks would help lure young boys back to one of Coral's apartments or rental houses, where they would then help Coral strip the boys naked, bind their hands and feet, put duct tape over their mouths, then handcuff the victims to a two and a half foot wide by eight foot long wooden board. Now, as a side note, 
If you remember, when we covered John Wayne Gacy in Supernatural Current Studies podcast episode 86, we mentioned that Gacy got his idea for his torture board from Dean Coral. Right. But Coral wasn't in the papers yet. And at the time, no one knew what was happening over in Texas. So how did Gacy know? Well, yeah, I remember that I asked you that question. Yes. If there were reports of it, um, had he seen it? For that very specific reason, because they're happening around the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, often the trio would force their victims to write a letter or make a phone call to their parents, just like the previous murder we talked about, Mm -hmm. letting them know that they were okay and that they were just going to be away for a few days. And that's the last communication parents would ever receive. Yeah. Now, for all intents and purposes, those who knew Wayne Henley and David Brooks, they said that there was nothing evil about them. They didn't stick out. They weren't neighborhood troublemakers. They both did come from what's considered a broken home, their parents divorced, and they did drop out of high school, but that's about it. That just described thousands of teenage boys across the country in any decade but they don't turn into sadistic, murdering assholes. So, with the crew assembled, shit gets crazy and fast. On August 17, 1971, 17-year-old Reuben Haney disappeared while on his way to see a movie. Haney made a call to his mother, telling her that he was staying overnight with Brooks, presumably at his house. Instead, Haney wound up at Coral's place, where he was gagged, raped, strangled, and buried in Coral Shed. On February 9, 1972, a 17-year-old man and son of a Houston police officer named William Branch Jr. was abducted, tortured, raped, and strangled, and wound up in Coral's boat shed. Before doing the boy in, Coral cut the kid's genitals off with a knife and placed them in a plastic bag. Branch was found buried in the shed, with the bag containing his genitals next to him. And Branch's father, the cop, died of a heart attack while searching for his missing son. Fuck, man. Damn. How did, um, is it, um, that whole, uh, placing the the genitals into a bag, is that, like, the only time he did that? Yes. Okay. That's what you mentioned. Okay. The next boy to be taken was Frank Aguirre. 18 years old, and one of Henley's co-workers at a local Long John John Silver's restaurant. Aguirre was engaged to be married to a woman named Rhonda Williams, who will play a much larger role in this story later. On March 24th, 1972, Henley coaxed Aguirre into going to Coral's apartment one night after a shift at Long John Silver's. Back at the apartment, Coral and Brooks were waiting. The trio started playing the handcuff game, And that's what Coral called it, the handcuff game, Hmm. just like John Wayne Gacy. And once poor Aguirre was secured in the cuffs, Coral jumped and dragged his victim into the bedroom to have his way with them. Ultimately, Aguirre was strangled to death, and after, Coral, Books, and Henry buried the body at High Island. Hmm. Next, on April 20th, 1972, Henley lured his friend, his own friend, Mark Scott, to Coral's apartment. Scott was forced to write a letter to his parents, telling them that he got a job out of town in Austin. As Coral, Books, and Henry were trying to tie Scott up, the young man pulled the knife he was carrying and swung it at Coral. Clipped him, too, but just barely. As Brooks was fighting to get Scott tied up, Henley grabbed a gun and pointed at the poor guy to pacify him. Ultimately, Mark Scott was strangled to death with a length of cord and buried at High Island, although his remains were never found. So that's by testimony, then? Yes. Okay. On May 21st, 1972, so this list is long, 17-year-old Billy, I'm going to pronounce it Balch, B-A-U-L-C-H, 17-year-old Billy Balch, who used to sell candy door-to-door for the Coral Candy Company, and his friend, 16-year-old Johnny DeLome, were picked up by Coral, Brooks, and Henley, while the two boys walked to a local grocery store. DeLome was strangled and shot in the head, apparently by Henley. Hmm. Bulch, is, was, yeah, Bulch was forced to write a letter to his parents claiming that he and DeLome found work out of town before being strangled, again, supposedly by Henley. 
both were buried at High Island. And in a cruel fucking twist, about 14 months later, on July 19, 1973, Coral Brooks and Henley abducted and killed by strangulation Billy Bulch's younger brother, Michael. <laughs> Michael Bulch was 15 years old at the time of his death and was buried at Lake Sam Rayburn in East Texas. Um, so at, at, uh, probably at the, at 71 is when these kids, these accomplices were, start, they like, they knew, okay, there's not a photo shoot. Right. But by then they were in like. They were in too deep. In too deep, obviously. But not, I mean like, I'm like, well, I committed one crime. That's not like that. I mean, in too deep with guys manipulation, right? Seemingly, at least. Is, is Coral manipulating them? Well, yeah, no, I'm saying he's t- they're too deep in that. I'm saying, well, way too deep. Yeah, and because, yeah, and, well, he, if you read if, just from this last person who was murdered, yeah, Henley Light, he did it. Yeah, he did. Right, he did, testimony, he, he did. did it, and they're bringing in their best friends, you know, or yes. friends or whatever. Yes, people they grew up with, right. Coral, uh, you know, kids that he's known, still since growing they, up with, they're kids. Good point. Yeah, Coral ones that he knew from back in the candy factory days. Mm-hmm. All fucked up shit. Man. Yeah, they're bringing their own friends. The list goes on. On July nineteenth, nineteen seventy-two, Steve Sickman was abducted while leaving a party in Houston Heights. He suffered many broken ribs before being strangled with a nylon cord, signifying that he probably put up a good fight. Mm-hmm. And Sickman was buried in Coral's boat shed. On approximately August twenty-first, nineteen seventy-two. 19-year-old, 19-year-old Roy Bunton disappeared on his way to work at a shoe store. Bunton was shot in the head twice and buried in the boat shed. Not much else is known about the circumstances surrounding Bunton's disappearance and murder. On October 2nd, 1972, 14-year-old Wally Simino, along with his friend 13-year-old Richard Hembry, were lured into Brooks' green Corvette while outside a store in Houston Heights. Simoneau tried to call his mother for help while at Coral's home, but the call was disconnected. Ultimately, Simoneau was strangled to death, and Henry was shot in the mouth and strangled. Both were raped and tortured. It's unclear where Henry was buried, but Simoneau was buried in the boat shed. It's weird to separate them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think yeah, that Hold on, let's talk about that for a second. Um, they, so far, this guy never separates his victims from a buried spot. Well, if they were, it seems if they were killed in pairs, he buried them in pairs. That's what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah. he wouldn't drive to two locations. It is strange for one night's work. Oh my god, I can't believe I said that. For one night's deadly whatever. Um, so, implying what could that imply? That allow me to pitch something. Yes, because you were talking earlier. Uh, first of all, you have been more than coy, more than subtle about their the connection between this guy and Casey. States apart. I really think there was, yes. I mean, south and north of the country, differences. Um, not, not coast differences, but still. Yeah, Midwest. And, yeah, Midwest, not Midwest. Um, Southwest. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and, uh, and the fact that he used a pornography ring um, as a lure. As an excuse or lure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Go you ahead. see what I'm getting at here? Maybe like... Keep going with that. The, this kid was the payment... A payment to an actual uh, pornography ring that he delivered. No, oh, and someone else completely buried him. Right, someone else took him, completely killed him. Or you could say that um, Henley, seems like Henley really took to his thing more than Brooks. It definitely, at the end of the day, it definitely seems like that. Um, maybe it was one of Henley's victims, or it'd be funny. I'm not funny. It'd be interesting to find out whether or not he um, he went hard on that kid. And he was like told, like, you find a spot for him. Uh, according to Brooks later, after all this came out, yeah. Henley did certainly enjoy a lot of it. Henley denies it, but according to Brooks, right. he would he would tear one off and I mean, be some ass. Yeah. They would do the same things that Coral was doing? Um, Maybe not the, not the extreme. You, I don't want to give give up the, 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 goods? the goods yet, but okay. you don't, we don't know. All we have is... I'm uh, saying, how far can that manipulation go? I mean, there's there's helping someone yeah. to hide, right? There's helping your father figure, right? Or uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Exactly. So there's one thing to help your father figure hide a crime. 
keep him from not being in your life anymore. And then there's another one relishing and doing the same thing he's doing. Yeah. Now there are degrees in that. Maybe they're not picking the pubics and stuff, but they're to still be raping or torturing or right, both. Right. In addition to helping to hide the body. It's very possible and we just don't know. Right. Well I'm saying there's that it's angle. There's the angle that this pornography thing is very much real. And oh, it was. was utilized um by this by Coral. Probably why some of the ones that are in, in missing for real are the ones that are not his victims, maybe. It's possible. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Sold out for real. There's a lot of theories here. Right. A lot of I don't theories. know what other theories it could be from that point. Can you think of a different one? Why they're buried separately? Unless it was just told, you go one way, you go another. Yeah, I, I don't think it makes sense. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can't think of anything else. Yeah. It's all theory. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want to say carry on, but carry on. No, it, it goes on. And finally, to cap off 1972... Mm-hmm. On November 15th, uh, 19-year-old Richard Kepner vanished while on his way to his fiance to call his fiance from a payphone. How old was he? 19. Oh, wow. Coral strangled him and buried Kepner's remains at High Island. And now, you got to keep in mind, when I say, you know, the ultimate was strangle, don't forget that checklist that went off on right. what this sick piece of shit did while he had these people captive. Right. It's not just strangling. That's just the end. Right. Yeah. So. I just don't feel the need to say that every single time. That right now to kick off 1973, Coral moved to a house that his father owned but didn't live in in Pasadena, California, and this is where Henley says Coral's bloodlust really kicked into high gear. What? According to Henley, what does that even mean for a guy like this? Yeah, right. What? what the? Yeah. Well, according to to Henley, Coral. He would he would get agitated and start kind of making these jerky body motions, like ticks, like really weird motions. And then he'd smoke a cigarette, which was really out of character for Coral. Hmm. And he'd say, quote, I need to do a new boy. Like he was having withdrawals from not doing this. I need to do a new boy. And he'd hmm. be ticking and smoking and acting fucking crazy. I see where you're like going with this. Like a bloodlust almost. No, I know where you're going with this. What? No, nope, I'm not going to go that. I'll say it to the end in case you have it. Okay. Okay. So... February 1st, 1973, 17-year-old Joseph Lyles, a friend of Coral's who lived on the same street as Brooks, went missing. It's a bad combo. You're a friend of Coral's and you live on the same street as Brooks. Now, he was raped and killed at Coral's Pasadena house and his body buried at Jefferson County Beach. Hmm. On June 4th, 1973, William Lawrence, three months shy of his 15th birthday, fucking young man and friend of henley's phoned his father and asked if he could go fishing with some friends and promised to return in three days and of course this wasn't the case at all this was these guys mo call your parents tell them this you're missing now you're a runaway right yeah and also like imagine how much of this kind of stuff like how many bad apples in our humanity like coral drove people to like you're never leaving my side again, kid. No one's going to let their kid go for three days at that <laughs> I, age. You, I, you know how many me? times I said that to myself while researching all this? No, I mean, no, I mean, uh, different times, I guess. I grew I up, I mean, my different times know. version is that when I grew up, I walked to school by myself. Right. And Which then, I'll never let my kids do. Right. Nowadays, <laughs> unheard of. But I mean, when I was growing up, bike? that oh, was okay. No. It was five blocks away, not that bad. No, us too. But, yeah. But still. Like, it wasn't, I mean, they wouldn't let me go for three days. That's for damn sure. Right. right. So there's there's an involvement right, from the 70s to the 90s, right, where I was doing that. Yeah. And then, no, uh, never again. No, now you're staying in I'll drive house. you. Yes. yes. <laughs> Here's the bus. So, of course, fishing wasn't real. That, that wasn't the case at all. Instead, Lawrence was lured to Coral's home. Now, before being killed, Lawrence was forced to write a letter to his father. And by the text of this letter, it seems that the kid knew the fate that was waiting him yeah. because Lawrence ended the letter with quote, daddy, I hope you know, I love you yeah. and your son, Billy end quote. Now it said that Coral kept Billy alive for three days, chained to his plywood torture device, continually raping and torturing him before strangling the boy. It's just heart wrenching, man. William Lawrence was buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. 
you know what's really horrifying about you telling this um, is that you cut the you cut the suspense in the way you're saying it because uh, you think of it you think of a of a, even a, even a really horrific graphic horror movie or like a, a more of a passe type where it's just murder as opposed to torture raping and murder yeah, yeah. Um, like you see those and there's a hope that the kid could leave or the victim could run away but we know the fact that you say the name they're dead already they've been dead all this time yeah, yeah. there is no escape for any person we mentioned here which is a true you undercut the you know what i'm saying it's like three days that was it was this it. guy did not get out no right that's what i'm saying on june 15th 1973 the trio abducted and killed a 20 year old father named raymond blackburn who was hitching, hitch, hitchhiking from Houston Heights back to his home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He was trying to get home to see his wife and newborn baby. Coral strangled Blackburn and buried his body at Lake Sam Rayburn. So he came back, huh? So he was back and forth? This, Pasadena? this victim? Pasadena and this place? He's still in Pasadena at this point. He's still at that home in Pasadena. The, the guy was hitchhiking from Houston Heights Back to his home in, in Baton Rouge. Then how do you get him if he's in Pasadena? Well, we don't know who. We don't know who exactly did the abduction. Hmm. Could have been Coral. It could. I said trio, but in all reality, it could have been just Coral. It could have been the three of them, or it could have been Henley Brooks. You know. Yeah, but that's a big. Pasadena, California, right? Yeah, Pasadena, California. How far is that from Houston? I don't know the the mileage. No, I know, but I'm saying it's far. It must not be uh, too far out of their way for for what they want to do. Hmm. Houston Heights that was their that was their stomping ground. That was their hunting territory. So I guess to these guys, it was nothing to travel. <laughs> That's insane, balls. Yeah, these guys were nuts. I almost feel like they went to California because the weather's always nicer. You know, is that they. Attack when the night when the weather's nice when the people are outside. Oh yeah, broad daylight. And in the winter broad is like daylight. the best times for them. Almost all of these were broad daylight. Yeah, and the winter is like dead dead zone. Yeah, you know, for the most part, at least with Christmas and stuff, because um, it's too cold probably to be outside. So that makes sense. But California is always nice. Yeah. I thought that's why they went there. Yeah, well, so is Texas. Texas too. Well, yeah, but you know, that's, you know, I guess so. But California is known to be always normal weather. I guess so. apparently for these guys that was that was nothing. Uh, I'm just curious because like why would they? Why would they go back and forth so much? Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Mm, okay, continue, sorry. So this poor guy was trying to get back home to see his wife and newborn kid. No. On July 7th, 1973, 15-year-old Homer Garcia was lured by Henley, who was attending a driver's education class with Garcia. Garcia was taken back to Coral's place, where he was tortured and raped, then shot in the chest and left to bleed out in Coral's bathtub. Garcia was buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Wow, that's extra. Yeah. I mean, they're all bad. But man, they left to bleed out there? It's just fucking Fucking weird. left them. Bro. On July 12th, 1973, 17-year-old John Sellers was killed just two days before his 18th birthday. Sellers was shot four times in the chest and buried at High Island. Interestingly, Sellers was Coral's Sellers was Coral's only victim to be buried fully clothed, meaning hopefully he was not viciously raped and tortured prior to being killed. They weren't able to determine that when they found the body. No, hmm. no, I think it was too badly decomposed. Then how do they know? So, they, but, but some of these you can tell, right? Because there's got to be something more than testific than testimony, right? There were so many bodies that were decomposed because all he did was wrap them in plastic mm-hmm. when he would bury them and right, it's he, not would, like the best he would coat them with, with, lime. with lime yeah, to speed up that like Gacy mm-hmm. to speed up that decomposition process and hide the smell too it lime doesn't really hu- well <laughs> does it? well somewhat I'm not saying really hides it but yeah, it, it was bad it was bad when these bodies were found but the smell anyway yeah um, so a lot of it was really hard to tell um a lot of the cause of death by strangulation, they could tell it was strangulation because the cord or the rope or the, the Venetian blind string was still wrapped around their throat. So they figured, okay, wow. strangulation. But otherwise, a lot of them were just too badly decomposed. Hmm. 
I find it interesting that we get a lot of this based on based on testimony. Yes, just two people. Okay, two people who were involved. Right. So, got to now. You got to take that with a grain of salt because they were fucking involved. You know. Yeah. Okay. Keep going because I want to ask more questions, but probably I didn't. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay well, on July twenty fifth, nineteen seventy three, eighteen year old Marty Jones disappeared along with his friend and roommate, seventeen year old Charles Cobble. Cobble was a school friend of Henley's, and both Cobble and Jones were last seen in the company of Henley. Both men were brought back to Coral's place. Before his murder, Cobble made a frantic call to his father, telling him that he and Marty Jones had been kidnapped by drug dealers. Strange. Ultimately, Jones was secured to Coral's torture board and was forced to watch Coral violently assault Cobble, strangle him, then shoot him in the head. The same thing was then done to Jones. Charles Cobble and Marty Jones' bodies were found in Dean Coral's boat shed. Finally, who we think is Coral's last victim, Mm -hmm. on August 3rd, 1973, 13-year-old Stanton Dramala disappeared while riding his bike in South Houston. Dramala later called his parents to tell them that he was at a party across town and was never heard from again. Turns out, he was lured to Coral's apartment, thinking he was going to collect empty Coke bottles, which he could then turn into cash. For some reason, that's just, that's really sad. This a 13-year-old boy looking to make some extra money. Instead, Jamala was tied to the torture board, raped, strangled with a cord, and buried in the boat shed. Now, thankfully, in early 1973, a breakdown started to happen between Brooks and Henley and Coral. It started with Brooks. Despite what many people thought, Brooks wasn't gay, even though he would let Coral blow him for gifts. Brooks married his pregnant girlfriend in July 1973, and they moved in together into an apartment outside of Houston Heights to try and put distance between themselves and Coral. Around the same time, Henley, too, tried to put some distance between himself and Coral. By attempting, to, by attempting to join the Navy, but he was rejected because he didn't have enough education. And according to reports, Henley was glad he didn't make the Navy because he was afraid Coral would go after his own little brothers if Henley wasn't there to protect them. Oh, yeah. Crazy. So we could see the seeds of doubt growing, and if these seeds didn't begin to grow, there's no telling how long the killings would have continued. Then, on August 8, 1973, Henley and his new girlfriend, Wanda, Rhonda Williams, who, if you remember, had been dating coral victim Frank Aguare a year earlier, and Henley's friend, Tim Curley, all went to Coral's house, house for a party, for what Henley insists was supposed to be just a night of fun, not murder. Mm-hmm. The foursome drank, and they huffed spray paint all night long. <laughs> And when Henley, Williams, and Curly passed out, the Candyman sprang, sprang into action. After hog-tying his guests and also gagging Curly and Williams, Coral began to kick Rhonda Williams in the ribs repeatedly with vicious force. Coral then dragged his minion, Henley, into the kitchen to scold him about how upset he was that Henry brought a woman to his house. Now, Henley knew all too well what was in store for him. Yeah. So he begged for his life. And Coral finally let Henley go, only after Henley promised to kill his friend, Tim Curley. <laughs> so the two walked back into the living room, Coral feeling all randy, armed with a twenty two caliber pistol, and Henley, reluctantly, with an 18-inch 18, 18 butcher knife. Then Coral dragged Curley and Williams into his bedroom and fastened them both to his plywood device. Curly on his stomach, naked and spread eagle, and Williams naked on her back, next to Curly. There was plastic meticulously laid out on his bedroom floor. Now try to follow this. Mm -hmm. Once secured, Coral ordered Curly to fuck Williams while he, Coral, fucked Curly. But Curly either couldn't do it or he wouldn't do it to Rhonda Williams. Coral then ordered Henley to fuck Rhonda while Coral fucked Curly. Can you follow that? I did. Now, when Coral began to rape Curly, he put his gun down. 
and that's when Henley grabbed the gun, aimed it at Coral, and is reported to have said, quote, I cannot go on any longer. I can't you have you kill all my friends, end quote. I can't go on any longer. I can't kill, have you kill all my friends. Henley then pulled the trigger and shot Coral in the head, the left chest, and once in the back. Coral died where he fell, in his hallway, facing the wall, and buck naked. Dean Coral was 33 years old at the time of his death. Henley had killed the monster, and the murder was mm-hmm. ultimately ruled a justifiable homicide. So yeah. now he's dead. Yeah. And this is the reason why information, it's not scarce, but it's got to be taken with a grain of salt. Investigators, psychologists, profilers, no one was ever, ever able to talk to this guy. So all we have is the testimony of his two henchmen. And how reliable is that testimony when their own lives are on the line? So, with bodies being badly decomposed, murderer uh, dead, only two witnesses are people who are involved and have everything at stake. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so, a lot of it's sketchy. So these victims to be, uh, they're all alive, right? The victims to be? Oh, at this last romp? Yeah. Yes. They all made it out? Yes. So, in fact, after killing Coral, Curly and Rhonda, Tim, Rhonda, and and Henley Mm -hmm. decided that the best course of action was to call the police. I mean, yeah, I hope so. You know, they thought, well, maybe we should ditch, maybe we should carry the body somewhere. Ultimately, it was decided they should call the police. Now, when investigators arrived on scene and and began to question Henley, one of the questions they asked was, why the fuck is all this plastic sheeting? Why does this guy, Coral, who you just have killed, board device. have handcuffs and a large plywood device in the bedroom? Exactly. Now, at this point, police still have no idea what they're dealing with about what kind of ravenous serial murderer Coral yeah. was. If, during questioning of Henley, he didn't let it slip that he heard Coral talking about killing some kids and burying them under a, a storage shed. Oh, he said that? He did. Oh. He slipped. If he didn't slip, police might not ever have known about Coral and simply chalked up the murder as just that. Simple murder. Huh. So you're saying Henley wouldn't have said anything? It, it, it says he slipped. He said he slipped and just let it slip out. Why is all this shit here? Why the plastic? Why the handcuffs? Why the board? Why? The, oh, you know, I heard him mention that he killed some kids and buried them. Boom, that was it. Hmm. So, police decided, after Henley slipped, police decided to press him. And eventually got specifics about this storage shed. Yeah, right. Shed number 11 at a dry dock marina called Southwest Boat Storage in Houston. Now, this boat shed was a 12-foot by 30-foot windowless corrugated metal shed that Coral had been renting for about three years. In fact, at one point, Coral asked the people he was renting the shed from if he could rent, if he could rent another because his was getting too full, hmm. this fucking guy. Once on site, police opened the shed, shed number 11, and were immediately overcome with the stench of decaying meat. Yeah. Police on, on scene threw up. Some chain smoked to smell the cigarette smoke instead of rotting flesh. Police didn't yet know Henry's involvement in the murders. So Henley was allowed to stay on site while the initial excavation took place. Reporters talked with Henley, and and Henley was sort of treated like a star by the media, the boy who killed the monster. Ultimately, 17 bodies were uncovered in the shed, or underneath the shed, actually. Body on top of body, naked and wrapped in plastic and covered with lime to help speed that decomposition process. Bodies located the furthest down in this hole in the shed were nearly liquefied. Really? Human fluids missing with dirt, creating this foul muck that investigators had to wade through. Now, I watched some video about this and, and, on YouTube, and at one point, I was watching a news clip about the murders, and investigators were carrying a body wrapped in plastic out of the shed and towards this stark white medical gurney. When the, when the investigators lifted the body up and over the gurney, about to set it down, this large, 
nasty pool of reddish brown liquid poured out of the plastic and splashed onto the sterile white sheets of the gurney. Wow. It was fucking horrific. I bet. This is on the news. Now, after the boat shed excavation commenced, David Brooks started talking to authorities. And Brooks admitted that both boys, both their involvements. Yeah. Henley and Brooks took authorities to two other burial locations. One at Sam Rayburn, Rayburn Rev- Reservoir in deep east Texas, and the other at High Island. Now, at High Island location, the excavation process turned into a fucking circus. There were bikini-clad girls and their boyfriends watching as bodies were being uncovered. Families on, on picnics looked on in horror. Someone's chihuahua got loose and jumped into one of the graves and began barking like crazy. There were throngs of reporters. And even a Mercury astronaut over at NASA ordered a helicopter to fly over the area and use infrared equipment to look for bodies. It was nuts. Now, no one knows for sure how many of Dean Coral's victims were buried at High Island. And today, after Hurricane Ike whipped through southeast Texas in 2008, a lot of the beach where bodies were supposedly located that haven't been found, it's now underwater. So we may never know just how many bodies the Candyman and his henchmen buried there. Hmm. So to recap, 17 bodies were uncovered, uh, were recovered under Coral's boat shed. Six were recovered at High Island, and four were found at Lake Sam Rayburn, the reservoir. Now, as recent as 2012, a filmmaker named Josh Vargas found evidence of a possible 29th victim among Elmer Wayne Henley Jr.'s possessions. The evidence is a grainy black-and-white photo showing a fully-dressed, terrified-looking young boy with longish brown hair, bent over, and there's a handcuff on one of his arms. The boy's in what looks like a hole in the floor, or maybe a hole in a wall. There's a toolbox next to the boy, with instruments in it, that was identified as Coral's toolbox. Hmm. And experts say the scene in the photo does match the interior of one of Coral's residences. So there's definitely more than 28 victims in the Coral case, no doubt about it. Now I'll leave a link to the picture in the show notes of this new evidence. But please, beware. The, the photo is it's haunting after knowing the story. Yeah. Do we know what year that was taken? We don't. Because you can tell sometimes from film stock. Nothing. Nothing. And it was found in a box of Henley's belongings that were stored in an abandoned school bus. His mother packed up all of Henley's shit put it into this abandoned school bus in a field by their house uh-huh. and let it sit there for 40 years. You're kidding. When this filmmaker was starting to do a movie about the Candyman murders, he found him. Found him. As he's flipping through these pictures, this kid photos falls out. And experts say it doesn't match any of the known victims. So it's someone else. What about the ones that are like and mush and stuff? Up. For some reason, the investigators said... This is this. I guess DNA match. is still DNA, even if it's mush. I guess. Yeah, because almost all the bodies have been matched now. Right. Okay, there's, but still, not I one. think there's one body mm. that's still out there missing. Okay. Um, they know there's 28. That 28th can't be found somewhere in there. It, it, that the body can't be found. Yeah. Now this new one, the other ones have been identified, even though some were misidentified in the beginning because of how badly decomposed. Yes. Um. So now they think this is. A new, a new one. Hmm. Um, but he, even though he mainly did everything in his apartment, how many? Confer- oh, remember, there were multiple apartments. Yeah. There were rented homes. He's bouncing around throughout all of this. So and he's killing in all of them. Yes. So yes. he brings his contraption everywhere with him. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one article I read said he had it. Uh, it was stored in like a, a back closet it was carefully wrapped in like blanket or something mm. he treated it very well at this point so yes your answer is I yes. bet he did he moved this thing yeah. location to location to location yeah he was completely transient completely transient through all these 
through all these murders. Because every time you said his apartment, you know, I, I, always, I guess I was in my head, I was thinking one place. No. Sorry, listeners, I made no. that. No, no, I know you mentioned that earlier, but I forgot. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. He's, he's bouncing around. Yeah. So maybe going back to when you said Pasadena to Houston, maybe that was a, maybe that was a stopover point. He had an apartment there because some of these apartments he would have for a few months. And then, boom, he'd move on. Yeah. So. Yeah, he really moved around. Now, besides locations I already mentioned, the boat shed, High Island, and, and Sam Rayburn, excavations also took place at Coral's Pasadena house, the backyard, yeah. as well as behind the Coral Candy Factory, or where the Coral Candy Factory was over in Houston Heights. Was it taken down? It was still there. Okay. It was still there. They were digging around building. Gotcha. But just days after the first bodies were discovered in the shed, further digging at the other sites was completely halted, stopped, never to be completed. Now, strangely, the Chambers County Sheriff that oversaw the High Island excavations, he said he would, he would not allow any more digging to continue until he received definite proof of the locations of more bodies. And that was it. Now, of course, definite proof was impossible because the main person involved in the killings, Coral, was dead. So wait, 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 wait. He was saying that this chief guy didn't want to keep burying or uh, excavating, digging, yep. because he wanted proof that dead bodies were there. Yes, but you can't find proof until you dig. Right? Okay. Preach. Then you. Sorry, let me sure I got it right. It makes zero sense. Mm-hmm. So, and the whole thing is didn't. Didn't this sheriff ever consider that Brooks and Henley might not know of other locations of murders they weren't involved in, right. but could likely have happened? Remember, when all this began, David Brooks walked in on two boys chained to Coral's bed, two boys that Coral didn't need his henchmen to lure. So Coral was also acting alone. It's not a far stretch at all, at all to assume Dean Coral was a singular predator as well as one who could act with accomplices. And the police, they were pissed about the decision to stop digging. Henley and Brooks said they believed there were other bodies in other places, but police were told, no, don't follow up. Now, some claim that once the U.S. mass murder number record was reached by Coral, that's when digging was stopped to keep from the public that this scumbag from Texas had just surpassed the record number of people killed in the U.S., by an individual, to save face. The serial killer holding that distinguished record for most kills by a single person up to that point in the U.S. was an animal named Juan Vallejo Corona, the machete murderer, who in 1971 killed 25 ranch workers in California and buried them in orchards. Coral is believed to have murdered 28, and most definitely there are more, but 28 confirmed. And because Coral was killed, we'll never know the true extent of his crimes. Hmm. And just so you know, in 1978, Dean Coral was replaced as the killer with the most kills by killer clown John Wayne Gacy. At 30 what? Who killed a known 33, 33 young men and boys in the Chicagoland area between 1972 and 1978. Now, when the Candyman murders were blown wide open... The news went global, global, and understandably, local Texas authorities and Texas itself was skewered in the media for not acting fast enough and for ignoring all the signs pointing to that there's definitely something wrong in Houston Heights. In retaliation for the public shaming, Texas Mayor Louis Welch basically blamed the parents, the victim's parents, with Welch stating, quote, the police can't be expected to know where a child is if his parents don't, end quote. And police chief Herman Short suggested at a press conference that the murdered boys were runaways whose parents didn't do enough to look after them. And then Short went on to deny any links between the victim, the victims and the killings, saying that it was a rumor created by the media. There's no links between victims and murders. It's just media. It's just made up by the media. Fake news. Was this a cover-up, or was Texas trying to save face? It seems very politically save face. Right. I mean, someone's ass was going to get chewed, for sure. Yes. 
<laughs> Remember, this was world news. Even the Vatican condemned the killings as being part of the devil's domain. Even Truman Capote, author of In Cold Blood, nonfiction, Great fucking book. Yeah, nonfiction novel about the 1959 slaughter of the Herbert Clutter family in Kansas. To, re- to revive his failing writing career, Capote attempted to write a book about the Dean Coral murders. He even flew to Texas when the story was breaking to see and hear firsthand what was going on. Why did he stop? Why did he stop? You know? He fell ill. Oh, when he fell ill. That, he he ditched the book. Right, and he died shortly after, yeah. didn't he? I think so. Yeah. Oh, I remember. Oh man, can you imagine his book on that, <sighs> dude? So I mean, this was this was fucking huge. Yeah. And today, no one no one knows about it. No one talks about it. So, whatever happened to David Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley Jr.? Well, in 1974, Wayne Henley was given six consecutive terms of 99 years as a sentence, a total of 594 years behind bars. He's now 63 years old and held at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice's Michael Unit, a men's prison in Anderson County, Texas, where he paints and he sold paintings at an art gallery, saying that his art is maybe the only good thing he could contribute to this world. Is it nice art? What's that? Yeah, how's the art? Um, from what I saw, it was kind of like landscape. Oh, I'm saying like nice, yeah, nothing like, like dark and clowns and shit. Yeah, no, it was like, yeah, like Gacy. No, yeah, it was yeah. kind of like landscapey and trees and water. Okay. Henley works in the prison laundry and says he doesn't like to sleep because he hates dreaming about the old days. Henley applies for parole every time, saying he's a changed man and he's now someone who his mother would be proud of. But thankfully, parole is denied every single time. How old was he when uh, all this stopped again? Uh, between 16 and 17, by the time he was caught. Yeah. Okay, continue. In 1975, David Brooks also received a life sentence and is housed at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Ramsey Unit in Brazoria County, Texas. He was convicted of the murder of Billy Lawrence. He has never spoken publicly about his crimes since being sentenced in 75. And if you remember the baby, he, he got married to his pregnant girlfriend. Mm-hmm. The baby he had uh, turned out to be a daughter mm-hmm. who regularly visited Brooks in prison when she was old enough to do so. Unfortunately, Brooks' daughter died in a car crash on the night of her high school prom. Oh, wow. That's awesome. It's kind of sad, isn't it? Like That yeah. kind of that got me a little bit. Yeah. No. And the jurors who convicted Brooks and Henley absolutely lambasted the police and the Texas district attorney, saying that the investigation left unexplored, quote, the possibility of the involvement of others and related criminals acti- criminal activities, end quote. So even the jurors are like, no, there's more to this. But Texas just shut their eyes to it. Yeah, I mean, you know. Now, we know Coral acted alone in the Jimmy Glass, Danny Yates murders, the one Brooks walked, walked in into on back in 1970. Or at least Brooks and Henley weren't in the picture yet. And Brooks and Henley both said that there are likely more bodies they don't know about. There has to be. Then there's Coral's own admission to both Brooks and Glass that he was working <laughs> to both Brooks and Henley that he was working for an organized porno ring. And I briefly mentioned the Chicken Joe guy, mm-hmm. that the private investigator working the Winkle Hill guy's case talked about. Gacy ran three KFCs. All this begs the question, mm-hmm. was there even something bigger going on with the Candyman murders? Well, in 1975, during a routine investigation, the Houston police found a cache of pornographic pictures and films depicting 16 individuals. 16 young boys. Of the 16 boys found in this pornography, 11 were positively identified victims of Dean Coral. So who are the other boys? Is there some truth to Coral's claim of being a handler for a much larger operation? Coral claimed his operation was based in California. But what if I told you there was a huge child sex and porno operation focused on young boys operating right out of Houston, with reaches all the way to Chicago and beyond, which possibly include Dean Coral, John Wayne Gacy, and another 
lesser-known Chicago serial killer named Larry Eiler, and others. Something called Project Delta. I'll just leave that there for now. Hmm. Um, real quick, you, 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 you put down a lot of bombs right there. Um, so are we saying that Coral did take some of these pictures? Because some of these were victims, 11 were victims. Yes, they were identified, whether it was DNA, whether it's through parents, whether it's through clothing. Do you know the state of photos they are? What state of the photos? The state of photos the subjects are in. Are they being tortured? <sighs> Did not say. Okay. Did not say. They posing, you know what I'm saying? Didn't say. Okay. Um, but say. but uh, they were 11 of our victims. So it's easy to say that if he did take those pictures, which I guess we won't know ever, slash, we won't know unless we see it ourselves and analyze it somehow. Right. Like the surroundings of it, the, the making of it, uh, what kind of camera stock was sold back then that he was access to versus the ones that he weren't, he wasn't accessed, whatever the hell. Um, it, okay, so most likely if, if he did do all those things, in addition to killing and raping and whatever, then there's a chance that these uh, these other boys are also his victims, that they're buried somewhere they haven't been found yet. Yes. That's, that's, yeah, a, that's a good logic true. track. Yes. So a good logical track. And the, I, I like I like the cachet thing because it kind of, the porno ring is connect, connects that to it, right? That he said that. Is <laughs> Absolutely. It connects us so well. And there was. there. It, the, <laughs> I'm, I'm giving a little bit away when I say Project Delta. Yeah, well, I know you are. Project Delta. You can't help yourself. And this isn't the, the granddaddy. I know. This is something that was happening, that was proven happened. <laughs> right, and also ah. it's, it's too much. It's too, it's not, co- it's, it's, um, it's too much. It's too coincidental that this guy, Gacy, and him had the same flavor of victims. Um, there was definite overlap. There were overlap. Very good chance that Coral is like his... Like showed him the ropes or something, you know, or Dude. someone showed them the ropes, or someone know. showed them. I don't fucking know. I mean, because you know, you don't just start off knowing how to build a contraption. But I'll tell you, this Project Delta hmm. had thousands of customers. Yeah, not hundreds, thousands of customers. Yeah, and a lot of them were very high-profile customers: hmm. police, politicians. Uh. People who could stop dick sites halfway through. Why were these things never connected when they were happening? All these boys going missing from this area. Well, just on a police enforcement like protocol stand or whatever, why didn't they see that these fuckers are not runaways? Right. From the beginning, you know, just labeling it off as, as runaways or not and, and not missing persons. It's just lazy. It's just a lazy way to not do police work. Lazy or See, I don't. I don't cover think. Up. I really don't think that part is cover up. Although they could be pushed that way. Well, like, oh, I don't know. you know, maybe a superior who is into it could tell them, "You're like, hey guys, don't worry, right? Don't worry. It's it's probably one of these. You don't take the day off. It's it's a runaway. Clear the desk. They're runaways. Right. Close the cases. Right. Right. But um, at the same time, a though, thing called clearing the desk. Yeah. Put an end to these things. Yeah, I've seen the wire. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, I mean. Clearing the desk, a lot of that came up with Smiley Face Killer when we cover that stuff. You know, that's another theory. That's it. Police right. are just trying to clear the desks and call them all drownings. Done. Move on. Put it together. Yeah. I mean, they're clearly not drownings. Right. <laughs> but not to digress. But the same thing. It's clearing the desk. And also another thing is that um, I'm not saying this is so uncommon, but it is relatively uncommon for serial killer um, like Carl to not have one killing ground. You know, most of them, like Gacy, um, tend to have one location. Right, yeah. So, I mean, uh, Houston Heights was definitely the location to choose from, mm-hmm. to take from. Because of the poverty. But Right. Yeah. But uh, the way he jumped homes is yeah. what you're saying, right? Right. Unlike Gacy, who right. stayed central at that Summerdale home. And some are weird, like, for example, like Son of Sam, but he went out to... To he went out to kill and probably escape his house for anything. Yeah. So like his yeah. was different, and obviously very different demeanor. And it wasn't sexually based. You know, it wasn't right carnal. You know what I'm saying? 
you know, there's some ties, you know, with Son of Sam and and being neglected by women. You know, that's one theory, but yeah, but at best, overall, that's, yeah, not like you said, carnal, right? But it's more that's hatred for something. It's not sexual at all. I mean, right? That's what right. I'm saying. Good point. Good yeah. point. It's uh, so you know, it's uh, it's funny how the coral guy, you know, then have a centralized location. No, I find that interesting. Jumped all over. So why didn't do hotels? Did you do hotels too? <sighs> no, so no curious about um, that. Articles talked about hotels. That's insane. No, talked about hotels. Um, I thought you'd get away with it easier back then. In yeah, hotels. hotels, yeah. Well, look what the Ripper Crew did at hotel. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. No, no article. It was always. But the Ripper Crew was after this. Eighties, wasn't it? Early eighties, I want to say. No, don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. My notes. There's so many. Things. I mean, so many. I almost want to go back to a few of our episodes because I want to. I don't remember all the details either. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's hard. It's, yeah, hard. it's hard to remember. Now, here's my other question for you. Emotional question, I guess. Um, yes. How much do you blame the, the, the two kids, Brooks and Henley? I mean. <laughs> They were caught in their late teens. Not even 18, I think. No, no. Um, yeah, I've never been a, a victim of brainwashing, so I don't know what it's like. Well, have you seen commercials? Then you will have no, I'm kidding. No, no, you know what? You got a good point. I mean, That's... we're all victims of brainwashing. It's just very light degrees that are all socially acceptable. Now, beyond that, yeah. you haven't been a victim of brainwashing. Correct, correct. So, I, you know, just how impressionable and pliable were these two kids at the end of the day? You know, they came from rough homes, but they didn't come from homes where they were, you know, I can tell you, uh, horribly assaulted. I can tell you something, or, something really quick that never happened to me, uh, thank, thank God, obviously. And I didn't have, uh, I didn't come up from a broken home ever right, right. like that, never. I see other people like, oh, yeah, my mom's divorced. Like, well, my, my friends can't even say the word divorce. Um, but uh, I was probably just as impressionable as these kids are, especially Brooks, probably. Huh. And I was just as whatever, you know, with uh, some of the other stuff that were about the background. You know, I said, like, oh, you're kind of like me. Like, yeah, I was oh, exactly I like that. Um, Did you ever meet anybody who had an impression, uh, who made an impression on you so much that you looked to him like a father figure or anything like that? No. See? It's hard to put yourself in that, that guy's shoe, or both of these guys' shoes. No, yeah, I'm not saying I can. I'm just saying that I probably could have been. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, know myself now. Uh, now I won't do it, but like, yeah, back then I probably could have been to not to be convinced to do this, maybe, but like the steps to start it or something, whatever. However, this worked out for them. So, and, if you could put yourself in their shoes that way, what do you think? Because I, I, I don't know about a life sentence. Really, I don't know. I mean, there are victims as much as uh, not as much as the kids who died, but like. They are well, living Brooks, witness. Brooks was charged with he was charged with a murder, and the very specific murder. They yeah. were both charged with very specific murders. And Henley ultimately was charged with six murders, I believe. Yeah, he seemed to relish it. Right, right. So you still think? Well, maybe. Oh, okay, Henley. I'm not sure, but I think that incarceration over. I mean, if okay, incarceration. I'm not saying don't take it out of the mix, but mix it with, you know. Therapy? <laughs> yeah. They're 17. What the fuck? What do you, I almost feel like, what do you expect from brainwashing? Yeah. I, I know. If a kid grows up to, I mean, they're not, they're not they're kind of half grown up, but they're, they are victims. I don't see them as non-victims. They definitely helped. I'm not saying they didn't do anything. They're their own friends, man. But it's coral. They brought their own friends. Yeah. You know, I don't, you know how much how much of, of it was fear. Even Henley, the bloodluster, who enjoyed it more than he should have, obviously, um, turned out. You know, turned against this guy when he was starting to think for himself for a little bit. Right. You know, and still managed to get out of it. Like he made the hugest mistake, and the planet was just to follow this guy. But he, you know, he fought back. Yeah. Still, and Brooks was seemed to be even more. Let's not call them well adjusted, but more adjusted than the other two. You know, it certainly seems that way. It seems like he, it's against it does, the grain the to do all I the read, all the things seem... that he did and was coerced, not coerced, or manipulated to do. 
seemed to be against the grain, even if he was a psychopath. Like, he probably would go after women his own age, not even... Who would? Brooks, Brooks. had he been in the same mindset to murder and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying no punishment. I'm just saying, I don't know if their entire lives... No, I, I, I get you. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe on Brooks more. But therapy. How is not therapy not involved in this? this for me, not seeing myself in their shoes at all, hmm. ever, even when I was an awkward teen. Um, yeah, but you were a rapscallion. I think I was. I think, they're, I think they're where they belong. And, you know, do they ever get out? They have to be feeble to be allowed out. Yeah, I mean, that's, even that's a tough call. I just put a tough call on myself. I don't know. I probably, I would say, I. Feel, I just think that whatever they're in there for. I mean, sorry, you because I, no, I, I, I think I feel worse for Brooks than Henley, probably. Yeah, I'm highly in the same way. You know, maybe give Brooks a shot at at parole. I just don't know, man. I understand. Um, I mean, fuck, Coco Realis got out or is getting out. I have to check from the Ripper crew. You and told me about he that. He was an animal. I mean, just an animal as all animals ever can be. And yeah. He's going to get out. Yeah. You know, um, the things they did. Yeah. I, I, no, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i coming into more of a political, I'm, I'm this close, I'm a hair's breath away <laughs> from turning this into a political thing about our court system and how we choose to punish criminals in our society. I have huge problems with all of that. I even have huge problems with the way we think about them. Yeah. And I'm not saying bring the hangman's news or anything. I'm thinking opposite that. I don't. Are we trying to make people better and understand them better, or in the court it, system and in, in jail and in, 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 any, in anything like this? Yeah, no, just, absolutely not. I know we're not trying. Yeah, I'm saying, but not at all. and and it's blasphemous if I were to ever say if I was waiting for a political thing. Me saying this now would make me lose that campaign. <laughs> That's how stupid it is. Yeah, it's we're stupid. We're all stupid here. And I uh, yeah, it's just because it, that this guy. Let's just say Brooks now. This guy Brooks wasn't given the mental health he needed to get past this and become a fucking a person. You know, yeah. Yeah. even if even if you don't let me to, even if you won't let me free him at age I don't know, seventy or something. Let's say, um, at least let him be a complete. You know, let him be fucking sane in there. Like let him understand. Let him. I don't know. Not be. Whatever, yeah. Or that—that that, that, that is the. Def- I don't know. It's like you can't. What, what is he? You think he's really there every second? A Tony for those murders? Like, do you think those murders are getting get less murdered? Yeah. It's not changing anything. I don't, I don't understand it. It's starting to crazy, especially in this case because these guys were manipulated to do this. Yeah, they definitely were. Yeah, definitely and it looked were, like a. Right? It looked like a process. Every year it got worse. You know. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? Because that's one more kind of. Thing. Yeah, kind of. Just so, uh, so why did Coral do it? Right, all the while Coral was raping, torturing, and murdering young boys, he was keeping public appearance up. He worked at the Houston Lighting and Power Company, and his coworkers had nothing but great things to say about him. One of his landlords loved him, said he was the best tenant anyone could ever ask for. God, everyone says that about him, <laughs> right? Well, he was a great boy, and he got along with Henley and his brother so well. And he charmed Miss Henley, Henley, Henley so thoroughly, she invited him over for Easter dinner one year. Old girlfriend said he was a wonderful man who wanted to settle down, get married, and have kids. Even though on some of those dates, oddly, Brooks and Henley were also present. <laughs> what the hell? These are my bodyguards? <laughs> right. After the story broke, Coral's mother rushed to Texas to declare her son's innocence. Oh. It was the fact that Dean Coral couldn't settle down with the woman and be normal the very reason for his insane violent behavior did he torture his victims because he looked at it like he was torturing himself for having homosexual origins it certainly doesn't sound like he was born evil so what the fuck happened i mean it seems like a lot of self-hate a lot of self-hate yeah so how was coral allowed to operate for so long why weren't the missing boys ever pursued by houston police why was digging and searching for further victims halted, even when there was ample reasons to continue? And that, kind listeners, is for another episode. Oh, I had more. No, you can't. 
Okay, cool. I just wanted to end it. You gave me the cut sign. Like, I'm no, not cutting I'm cut, it. I was cutting. The, no. the, I'm done. <laughs> what was your last sentence again? I didn't know you were cutting it. I wasn't ready for your ending. Oh, no. I, I just ended it. And, and no, I... But to say, be continued almost. No, but you seem to give a cut The why, the why, the why. Oh, the why, okay. The why is for another episode. Uh, I had a theory about that. Uh, uh, not a theory. A thing about that is that um, it seems like uh, we're highlighting... Uh, we're going to compare serial killing to another profession. <laughs> Um, that obviously makes no money. It you know th- this guy is this guy's Scorsese, the other guy is Spielberg, right? That's how good they are. I think we just hide the best ones, Mur- like, as far as murderers. Yeah, we just we because those are the ones we know more. We can cover so much, most covered, most talked about, except for this guy. Well, I'm saying, I mean, not more. Right by the time he was worldwide. Yes. At, right. Yes. You don't get there by... <laughs> right, right. Oh, yeah. At the time, definitely. You could sell a million units of the worst, most worthless thing uh, on the planet. You could... If you sell a million rocks for a million dollars a piece, it probably still wouldn't make you worldwide famous as this guy did, okay? At the time. That's what, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's an interesting analogy, but okay. I mean, it's the first thing you. that popped in my head. I, I don't you. know. It's probably something stupid. Whatever. Um, ooh, Fabric X. Anyway. Uh, but we're just... Talk, we're highlighting the best. Unfortunately. We're highlighting the ones that managed to slip through the cracks. How many countless ones only made it to three before they got caught? And would have had a career of this long if it hadn't been for that cop stopped him for a missing taillight or the or his wife catching in the middle calling the police sometime or oh, yeah, a victim yeah. running away and telling the cops, oh, this is the guy's description. I'm saying, we're, like, we're not talking about the ones that killed three, four, five, one, or almost killed one that would have been the start of a long career of murdering people. You know, we're just talking about the ones that succeeded the most, right? Yeah. So in, in the grand scheme of things, it seems like the percentage is valid for any kind of thing that we do happen here. Like from the very best directors and the very best CEOs in the world, there's just as many serial killers out there. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's funny that when you mention that, they say real high-profile people like that mm. do share a lot of the traits Right, it of takes serial killer. It takes a they certain. Just took a different path. It takes a certain but opportunity. They have the capacity to right. become the capacity. Right, it's not in everybody. Everyone follows something different. We're all not cap. We're all not capable of being number one at anything because then there wouldn't be a number one. Right, it'll be number zero. Um, so, like the, these are opportune pe- people. People will take opportunity and make it their bitch, and <laughs> and they get lucky for that long until they fuck. Because so many don't get lucky. Thank God. So many murderers don't get that lucky. Yeah, thank God. Um, I don't know if Dean Coral was lucky. No, I, I mean, he... I haven't figured that out yet. I mean, I think the uh, I think the, the real trait of a successful murderer or whatever is like being that cunning and that smart. You can't be stupid. Like, obviously in general they're stupid because they're doing this. Right. But like, you know what I'm saying? They... they they have intelligence. They have to have high intelligence, not just regular intelligence, because this guy knew enough to always move, always knew. I mean, he didn't know enough to dispose of bodies differently that would have made him harder to catch or anything. But let's just call that a pride thing, let's call it whatever, whatever. Maybe a convenience thing, right? But this guy knew to get kids, to get other kids with him, manipulated the kids yeah. for years to do what he wanted. Yes. And they're, punish- and they're being punished for his crimes. Undoubtedly. For the most part. Yeah, I would say. That's yeah. insane. That's not dumb. You know, that's like, that's a CEO, you know? <laughs> that's right. So, and you said you had a question. Right. Uh, did you, I don't know if you planned this on purpose. What? The adrenochrome thing. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sure. The episode? No. The, what you said in this episode that planted that in my head. Can you recall? No. When he was on his way to Pasadena, what did Henley say that he was doing? He was on his way to Pasadena. What did Henley say he was doing? Or Brooks, maybe. Um, testifying that he was shaking, wanting to kill a new boy. Oh, God. That's right. Bloodlust. My first thing I thought Withdrawal. of. Withdrawal. Withdrawal symptoms. What did we talk about with the adrenochrome? Oh, shit. I didn't even think of that. It's the first fucking thing I thought of. Yeah. Oh, man. That just... Also, California seems to be like, that's the 
where it is, where it kind of not started, but it was a group of people that are kind of known to where they're kind of doing it. It's almost like he's on his way to get some supplier or something. I mean, you just, you just, I'll find out how to extract this so you can get more from accidentally. Because he's chewing on these fucking generals too. Like, what the fuck? I, I, it seems like it's just the next step to it. Man, uh, <laughs> don't know. That's fucked up. That's interesting, right? No one, I mean, I'm, I get habit, but you can't Jones from murdering. I don't. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Maybe can, I've never know. murdered. I, I guess I don't know. <laughs> I mean, m- maybe there is, but like to the extent of to show those symptoms like that, as if he's hasn't had coffee in seventy five days, or Anne hasn't had a cigarette, Anne has just quit all those things and cocaine, and he's fucking shaking really for not murdering. That does. I don't think that happens. Maybe the mental loss of it, yes, but not the not the physical. Cannibals have that. Cannibals get shaky when they don't eat human meat after they've been eating it for a long time. That that's a thing I, I've heard before. I don't know if that's a true thing. People check me up on my math there. <laughs> but uh, but the unicorn is the first thing I thought of because of what you well that episode was. Yeah, I didn't even I didn't even put that together. <laughs> well, what do you think? I don't. Know, I think we should research that. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how we can. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I've got, I'll look into it. That makes it even see. worse that he's dead. I mean, not that he would say anything, well, you know, but probably not. I mean, I'm glad he's dead, but a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, yeah, I'm glad he's dead. And I made a, I made a huge error. What in that in that part? In a few parts. Well, oh, what few parts? I made a huge fucking error. Oh, what? And I don't know what to do about it right now. Nothing to correct right now on there. <sighs> it's a correction. That has to be, it, it's a correction. Oh, okay. Fuck. All right, let's do it. I can't believe I did this. That's okay. But if people don't listen to the end of this episode, they're never going to hear this correction. Most likely they will. And then we can mention the correction uh, in the next episode at the top. Oh, my God. I can't believe I did this. As part of the announcements. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. I can't believe it. <laughs> 5.35. Pasadena? It wasn't Pasadena, was it? It's Pasadena, Texas. Oh, there's a Pasadena in Texas. There absolutely is, and it's right outside the stomping grounds. Uh, okay. I fucking botched that. Oh, uh, okay. That's okay. Well, that's common. <sighs> no, but your your question. Uh, it started with your question. Wait, Pasadena to Texas. That's crazy. Yeah. It was Pasadena fucking Texas. Yeah, that's why I was so flabbergasted. That he would dro- what would he drive... And I said that was states away. No, it's okay. When people think Pasadena, they're obviously going to think, if someone says Santa Fe, you know, Santa Fe, St. Louis, no, that's not, or Missouri, no one's going to... How did I not catch that? That's all right, man. How did I not catch it while we were talking about this? That's all right. It's corrected. We'll mention the correction again at the top of the next show. That way people know, for sure. <laughs> Although you are probably listening to this also. You think we lost listeners on that one? No. It's a harmless mistake. It's a, an excusable mistake. Now, if it was like... <sighs> Some town that no one's ever heard of, and then you accidentally forget the state, then maybe that's worse of a mistake. But everyone knows Pasadena, California. <laughs> yes. Like everybody knows what that is. No, this is. No one mistakes Chicago to not be in Illinois. That's, that's you know where the father owned the home that Coral moved into, and that's right. the home where Coral died, Pasadena, Texas. He never left the state. That's good. <sighs> not California. That makes, that makes more sense. Didn't, but he still moved around a lot. Didn't leave the state. But oh, yeah, he did. Yeah. He bounced around. Yeah. What was the other mistake? You said you have a few? That was it. Oh, okay. Let's just, that's it. It was that's Pasadena, fine. Texas. It's not that bad. You Don't think? beat yourself up. Stop. Stop it. All right. You know how I get My question still applies, though. The shaking is not right. No, it is. It's strange. Very strange. And I don't seem to be in any of the testimonies uh, between Henley and, and Brooks that no cannibalism was taking part in this because they were involved in the kidnapping all the way to the burying. I'm sure they would have mentioned that kind of behavior. So, or is even that behavior too taboo to talk about? I don't know. Out of all the fucking things, you fucking kidding me? I don't That's know. too taboo. I mean, I guess I can see someone thinking that in their heads, but I don't think so. Like, oh, I'll admit to it, but at least I'm not a cannibal, right? Mm. Am I right? You I know. mean, really? I might have done these things, but hey, at least I didn't do that. Right? Yeah, I know. That's weird. Pasadena, Texas, Oscar. 
Pasadena, Texas. Like Paris, Texas. <laughs> Paris, te- yeah, and then Cora went to France, apparently. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, motherfucker, oh, flew yeah, all the way think, back. Yeah, I don't think in 88 episodes I screwed up that bad. I don't know. I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> God, I'm, I'm kidding, sorry. I'm kidding. Stop it. It's fine. Our listeners have already forg- – you hear that? They're forgiving you right now. <laughs> you hear it? Yeah, I thought it. I just heard the click of a radio going off, turning <laughs> off. Or a delete of the podcast in iTunes podcast Oh, list. is that what you think? Delete you this. No, no. Stop worrying. Guys, send him some feedback to reassure him. Uh, okay. That's it. That's all I have. The, 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 the adrenochrome connection the adrenochrome was, was the last uh, – hella interesting. It's the only thing I have. With the withdrawal symptoms. That's, that's very interesting. I'll see if I can research it, see if there's anything out there. I mean, especially since you've obviously laid down the, the works of them, him being connected to other murderers in other states, too. So there's that. Cool. But the record ring stretches far in the dark world. So, yeah. yeah. And listeners, there'll be, there'll be pictures of uh, Dean Coral, of, of Henley, and of, of Brooks. Mm-hmm. In the show notes, as well as that photo of the uh, possible 29th victim. Uh, just watch out for that 29th victim. It's a, it's a dizzy. It's a yucky photo. Although I kind of want you to show it to me because I don't see it. Yeah, no, I'll show you. I mean, if you just saw the photo, you'd be like, oh, okay. But knowing the story. Right, no, no. That's know, why I want this. But all that will be in the show notes. Listeners, make sure and check out. If you told me you had a photo of the murdered child in pieces, I wouldn't say no. I don't want to see that. Right, no. I just want to see the picture as you describe. No, yeah. I'm not aiming to see this, guys. All right. Should we call it? Yeah, let's call it. Oscar, take us home. Yeah. close together and there was these I think they were Koreans not 100% because I don't know the difference for real I'm sorry and that's racist I, I mean I don't know I mean I mean, I don't know the difference between a Colombian and a Peruvian either so it's not a big deal um, anyway and they were like this family I think or friends at least older people not like old old like your age uh, okay it's so like 50 alright we'll take it easy you know a little like <laughs> You know, no, I don't. Yeah, you know, you know how you guys like to sleep, right, all the time. They communally took a little mini nap at, at their table, like they sat against, you know, because some of the stuff is like back. You know, you have a, like a little couch version of it, yeah. and then they're on the chairs too, and they all communally were asleep for a good ten minutes in in, in the Starbucks in the middle of the day in Starbucks in my store. You're fucking kidding! I'm not. I'm not what, kidding. What were you guys doing at the store? I mean, we were serving tons of customers in the line. I mean, the, we had customers there. It was a, it wasn't a dead day or anything, and they they took a nap, and then I went to the back to do something. They came back, and they, you, they were just gone. I'm like, okay, they just took a nap together. Why does this annoy me to no end? Oh well, that doesn't annoy me. This grates on me for some reason. I don't know why. I can't figure out why. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe here is more. Well, hopefully, this will annoy you more. So I said some. She said something like, "I'm um, like." That's weird, right? Or something like that. I don't remember yeah, something. We're talking about it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's weird, but maybe it's more common for them. Like, there's no, and she started talking about there's no culture on the planet that would do that. I'm like, that's a lie. You don't know that. I'm like, of course, there could be something like that. Like, there are people who take lunch naps in the middle like, of the day. In Italy, that's what they do. In Italy and Mexico, they do it in small towns. They that's close they down do. for a whole hour to go fucking sleep for a while. Every Mexican in Mexico will find a nice tree and lay under it like a lion. What? Oh, I think that got specific. I, mean, I think they go to their homes, but. Like, oh. <laughs> I, mean, no, I don't know if there's enough trees for everyone. Um, but the point is, is that they do that. And yes. I said that as an example. Yes. You know, not to say that everyone sleeps in the middle of the day in the middle of a store or something. But like maybe these people are from a town where they do that. And, and she started railing against how that is impossible and that she's read books and all this stuff and how cultures come from. Like you can't. And I told her, you can't say definitely that every culture that you know, every culture know enough to know that none of them t- do this. You right, can't yeah, say that. Exactly. All I'm saying is that there is a possibility that you don't know something, and it's not the end of the fucking world. And we had an argument for like an hour. Oh, my God. On the floor. I mean, some of it got heated. Some of it was more jokey. 
But I was just trying to tell, like, this is not, I'm not telling you that there is one for sure. I'm telling you that you don't know there isn't one for sure. And meanwhile, these people are like, hey, I'm trying to fucking sleep over here. Oh, no, we were making, oh, I mean, we were making all the drinks and stuff. And they had left already. But, uh, but man, we were just, like, on it. And she was like, you just did not understand that you can't know everything. You could literally visit every single uh, country on this planet and still not know their culture enough to know if they nap in the middle of the day. <laughs> that's, imp- that's impossible to know for sure. I don't know what's no, worse, the napping in the day or this person's response. This person. <laughs> this person's worse. Do the I, napping was fine. No, They didn't interrupt anything. It was great. It's very strange. I'll take them over teenagers every fucking day. Uh, that's true. So, Should we say this person's name? No. All right. Um, I don't think she listens to the podcast. But uh, it was so infuriating. And you just reminded me of it. And I haven't thought of it since that day, but still. With, it was with not, the now it's coming back. Huh? With the non-player character? Right. NPC. You call them NPC. That's exactly right. They're very NP- Yeah. Oh, it's pre-programmed fucking people, man, and they're programmed by like memes and things. Yeah. That's how they. So they got to read five books, and they think they're smarter than everyone on the planet. Like, no, you don't know enough yet. You don't know that for sure. Yeah. I can never. The older you get, the the more you realize you don't know anything. This is that is very true. You have to. You can't say anything for certain. Not everything. Only about yourself. That's it. Yeah. The rest is like, fuck. I don't know. You're right. You don't know. Annoying. How can you possibly say anything for sure? Oh, it's, it's very annoying. Yeah, quite annoying. Um, she's gonna make a great doctor someday. <laughs> I don't know what she's aiming for. Wow. Well, if she gets all her education off of memes, because you could. Oh no, that's a different person. Than that oh, person. That's a different person. But she also communicates in memes too. But no, that's a different person. Yeah, communicating in memes. I, I just I don't understand it. Hmm. It's not real, people. It's not real. I mean, the memes are real. I guess they exist. But uh, the I guess the the Jedi force of it, like just strict that only. It's 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 mind boggling. I guess just the the consumption of it. You can spend fifty percent of your consumption of media only in memes. That's insane to me. That is, that's insane to me. And I'm sure it's higher for them. Honestly, I'm sure it's higher. Wow. But I just don't know. That's just insane to me. And I don't know if it's a case of me getting older, Jay. Is it a case of me getting older? Are we? Is just something we won't understand? Is this one of those things? Finally, generationally, that we will not understand. No, because there's no there's no merit behind any of this stuff. <laughs> I agree. There's no merit. I agree. There. But if you ask my mom, heavy metal has no merit either. But I also don't spend night all that time listening to it either. So I mean, maybe it's not quite the same example. I also don't live by it or anything. I mean, this is definitely the I want it now generation. Yeah. Right. So that, yes, maybe it's, it feels like that. Yeah. You know, Short newspaper articles. It could be the best fit. Enough. It could be the greatest. Memes are the new thing. It could be the greatest joke on the planet. But if it if it's more than thirty seconds, no one will watch it. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, well, that's awful. It's it's a sad state. I think we're yeah. missing so much. I think so. Yeah. Look up, people. Look up. You're gonna have mutated thumbs, and your necks are gonna be too long because you're always looking down, stretching. Mutated your neck. thumbs. They'll have mutated assholes, too. Yeah, they will. It's all this bullshit they're taking. <laughs> they're releasing through their... Oh, okay, this is dumb. <laughs> no, just keep, keep going. I, I, do, I have some stories today for the intro. Uh, There's some very weird things happening. Oh, okay, cool. I saw Lords of Chaos. That was weird. I want to see that. Yeah, we're, we're reviewing it. I was reading it. the book. It's but... coming out this week. We get, yeah. That's uh, in... Um, um, Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> Rory Culkin. Rory Culkin yeah. played, de- not not dead. Did he play Varg? No, he didn't play Varg. He, he played um, Euronymous. Euronymous. That's it. That's it. So you know the story? Oh yeah. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Tell me the story as I you know reading, it. I was reading the book. Um, Wait, recently? Not, well, no, probably last year. I left it on a plane. What? Really? I was reading the book and I actually uh-huh. left it on the plane. I actually had the book. <laughs> nice. So how was it? Um, it was really interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. I hate the music, but the scene from the... You know, like black metal? No, I, do, I, black do metal. Not, I do not. No. <laughs> I've tried Minister Sal. He's tried to get me into oh, I know. black metal and death metal for 10 years, 20 years. Yeah. I just can't do it. Yeah, I know. But the story, the culture, the, the legend behind this type of music, it's fascinating. Well, how, fuck, these are people who drink their Kool-Aid, man. Right. So that's what I was going to say. So the book is biographical? It's, histor- it's like historically thing, or is it like made up? I guess no, it no, it's not made up. Okay. It's, it's telling the whole story about... The start of Norwegian Euronymous. black metal? Yes. Because yes. he started, I guess? Because Euronymous started it. Or Mayhem, with, whatever. With, with Mayhem. Yeah, yes, I Mayhem. I think so. Well, based on the movie, I saw. I think they were like the first one. Yeah, I guess the, the first, first... big one. At least the first big one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and does it say anything about the background of why they made it or how the the iconic class version, like the, how the icons of burning churches happened or how the drinking blood happened, how the violence of it, like the imagery of that, imagery of that? Yeah, it was. It was. I just... Oh, I'm just curious how real, the, because the book, the movie does something very smart that I think is really awesome. And that is, uh, it doesn't say that it's based on a true story. It says it's inspired by the book. Oh, okay. So it's very free and open to explore and have fun with Norwegian black metal startups. Like, it's fu it, it has fun going with Varg and hanging with Euronymous and showing this awful thing. It's, it's still kind of very biopicy. But at the same time, it's not afraid to be horror. Cool. Uh, yeah, I want to see. And the thing is, that watching the movie, I was like, I was like, I don't know if this actually happened in real life, and it doesn't matter because in the moment I was enjoying it. But well, like, no, the the church burnings, the the murder, dead killing himself, you know, Varg supposedly killing Euronymous. Dead killing himself that way. Um, yeah, gunshot. Gunshot to the head. Yeah, but um, did he cut himself before? I don't remember because that they did that in the movie. But he cut himself. He cut himself in his on both wrists, and then his neck, and then he shot himself. Ah, uh, see, I don't remember. I just remember the gunshot. To I was the just head curious because what that's the that's when Euron Euronymous came in and supposedly took a piece of skull and ate a piece of his flesh or whatever. Took pictures too. Yes, because one of the pictures wound up being a cover for yeah. one of their albums. Yeah, okay, making and, sure because like, that happened in the movie. Yeah, and um, someone was telling me that the whole taking a piece of his skull and, and making necklaces like that shit never happened. That was just a story to make it seem that the, that Euronymous was hardcore. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, they, a lot of these guys, they believed all that shit. Some of it was staged, but some of these guys were, were serious. Mm -hmm. And in the church burnings and really thinking they're Satanists and stuff. Yeah, it's, I think you'll find the movie interesting. You should definitely watch it. I really, I do. I want to watch it. I There's mean, another we, one I saw on, uh, we had a, yeah. on Amazon, I think. I can't remember what, the, what it was, but it was another death metal hmm. kind of. History of death metal movie or documentary. I don't know. Interesting. Um, yeah, we Ralph and I had a forty-five minute discussion on that movie. So oh, it's really? Way longer than I thought we would. Yeah, have. I want to hear yours. Really. We were just having fun with yeah. like discovering the movie as we were talking about it because I wasn't. I guess I I, lo I love the movie came coming out of it, and then but I wasn't sure how I really felt so until after yeah. the discussion. So. Now, what do you think of the music? Do you like the music? Oh yeah. Do you? Yeah, I, that's not my go-to, but yeah. I like. Yeah, I definitely don't mind it. I like it. Sometimes I'm in the mood for it. You know, I guess over the years with Minister Sal, I mean, that's all he listens to. I guess there's been some songs where I kind of rock into it, but yeah. overall, I just can't. I just can't do it. That's too white for me. Too white? Too white for me. Dude, uh, they were really white. I mean, the actors are really white in the movie, portraying them, but yeah, yeah they're right. Norwegian. They were really white. Rory Culkin, that was a weird uh, choice. He, look, he, he looks the part. Once I think he does a good job full corpse paint. But. Yeah, I mean, the movie is definitely has an not, not an answer, but it definitely has a bias of a sort. Towards? Towards this movement, towards uh, as, as an opinion, I mean, not, as an opinion. Positive on, or on, negative? I think a bit of both. Oh, okay. Uh, has definitely opinions on Varg, on Euronymous, and what uh, kind of like, not exactly what their impact is to the world or to their community. It's more like the impact on themselves and what they what they, and they have an opinion on how much of their own bullshit they swallowed mm -hmm. and how much wasn't swallowed. Um, the movie is kind of plays with that. It's actually kind of a few more funny moments too that are kind of awkward, like office awkward. Well, yeah, a lot of these guys were just fucking dorks, dude. Yeah, they were, they were like just straight up dorks. Yeah, there was they were they were just kids rebelling against their you know their very strict religious upbringing, which makes sense. Yeah, and the strict society that they mm -hmm. lived in. Yeah, exactly. So of course they're gonna retaliate by making black metal. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But you know, Varg's—he's on YouTube. I, I subscribe yeah. to his YouTube oh, really? channel, Varg yeah. Lucky. And he lambasted the movie. He didn't like it at all. So it was complete. Oh no! Shit. It was. It's also very anti-Varg. It, it, really? it paints him to be kind of a an idiot, a equal parts sellout to like hardcore black metal guy. It, it does both at the same time. Ah, okay. You'll see what I mean if you watch the movie, but because um, it, it show it shows them as someone who's trying to fit in to these people, I see, and does over and above the stuff, meaning like burning churches and going crazy, like. But he'll do that to make him seem that way. Like he doesn't do it because 
he thinks it's the black metal way. He does it because he wants the fame. He's a poser. And he wants, he's a poser. Right. And the movie portrays him that way very vividly. So that's probably why he hates it. <laughs> it's very anti-Varg, even though Varg is in it a lot. I mean, he has some cool scenes for sure, though. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if the ending happened the same way in, the, in real life, too, of the movie, because that's a crazy ending. Couldn't tell you, because I left the book on the goddamn plane. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you ever want to get... Maybe that could be a topic one day for the show, hmm. is, like, black metal, death metal, and the history of... Because there's a lot of occult, there's a lot of creepy shit that would fit in our theme. They definitely fit a lot of occult stuff, and there are... Get Minister Sal to talk on it, because he knows everything. And, oh, yeah. And Nico, Nico, he loves classic rock. He loves metal. He's too young to know what he wants. He loves Christmas carols. Yeah, it's Christmas carols twenty four. Whatever he likes, and I love it. Whatever he likes, he doesn't count yet. Well, I think it does. I don't even think it counts for Talia yet. I mean, she'll reminisce on this age and either hate it for listening to that kind of music, yeah. or she'll like evolve it to liking more specific versions of that music. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, because I don't. I mean, although, yeah, I, I pretty much I've always liked the kind of music I listen to growing up. Because I grew up on garbage, right? Yeah. For me, I still love garbage. Grew up on Blondie. Blondie's cool. Love. Blondie's badass. Yeah. Uh, I love hearing the music in movies because they're they are really nice with the rights to give it to any movie. Who oh. wants them. <laughs> so you see them all over. Um, I also grew up with Selena, but I was also like a Mexican boy, so I had to. <laughs> but no, I love Selena. I'll defend her to death. But that's very different. It's like ballad love songs. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't. I definitely don't listen to any more than Selena. <laughs> I don't know any other one other person. Um, no, never. Yeah, I know that song, but that's it. I don't know anything else. You know, best I mean means kiss me, right? Yes. Okay. Like I just found out, El Milagro means the miracle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, <laughs> that was a funny text. I almost fell off my chair. Really? What? What, I, what made you think of it? I had no idea. What made I, you think I, of that? I have no idea. It was something on TV. What? I was in a hotel room, and it must have been something I was watching. And okay. Like, El Milagro, The Miracle. I'm like, wait a minute. Oh, they told you? It wasn't something you realized you were told? Well, no, because I've gone 41 years not realizing that El Milagro 51 Tortillas. Years. 41. Uh, the El Milagro <laughs> Tortillas is The Miracle Tortillas. And I love El Milagro, Milagro Tortillas. I'm so glad that you like that one because it is like a good brand. Oh, it's fantastic. Like, you didn't say something white and stum like some other <laughs> shitty brand that no one likes. Uh, not true. Tortilla people like, like Chi Chi's tortilla. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, or something other mainstream that's stupid. Yeah, no, dude. Also, I mean, Lager is kind of rare to find. Oh, we got them out here. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying you don't get them anywhere. Um, they're definitely in the city, too. But, like, a Jew won't have them. At least they won't have much of it. So it always sold out. There's never a run for you to buy. Wow. Yeah, yeah, whenever we see them. They have tons of other crap that they don't like. So. I'll yeah. buy it, or Katie will get it for me. And I just put them on the flame right in the stove, cook them. Shh, shh, shh. Yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with Delicious. the tortillas, right? Yeah, you can put, like, meat in there and stuff. Yeah, like, you mean tacos? Maybe some, oh, yeah. <laughs> I should bring some oil, and then I could fry you up some tacos with those. Thank you. I think we're having tacos tomorrow. And so my mom, and I know how to do this, too, I guess, but it's not that not so hard. She, I don't know how she does it specifically, but she mashes um, potatoes and cheese together and puts them and rolls them into a tortilla and fries them. Ooh. It's so fucking good. Oh. Same thing with beans and same thing with chicken. But the, 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 the potato-cheese combo... It's my favorite. That's not chilaquiles, is it? No. That's eggs. No, that because you need uh, red sauce, tomato sauce to cover it. Oh, okay, okay. And then you add cheese on top of that and chile and stuff like that, whatever you want. And that's chilaquiles? Uh, I think so. Or enchiladas, I'm confusing. I think I'm confusing enchiladas. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't eat those because they have chile and I don't eat spice. Oh, God. But uh, as a taco, I mean, you fry that shit up, that's great. Yeah, I think we're having tacos tomorrow. I also make quesadillas with like ham, like a slice of ham and a cheese. Ooh. Or maybe double, oh, not too much because it'll slide over. And you just double it up, flip it a couple of times, that's it. And that's really good. It's called synchronized. Fucking stop my ears. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not, I'm not Do you guys make kendulis? I don't know. What, I mean, the rice? Or is that just a PR thing, a Puerto Rican thing? Um, Katie makes it. And it's is that the one with all the stuff in it? Fucking delicious. Yeah, dude. The, the yellow rice? Yeah. But then yeah. there's also green olives in there. Like yeah, yeah, that's the Puerto Rican there. one. I had it for sure. I had it yeah. many, those many times. Black beans, or yes. whatever you call them. Yes. Not pinto beans or anything, but no. those are little round. Yes, those are great. Fuck, dude, she makes that. Oh. You know what's the what's the super saiyan version of that? Is paella. 
No. You had paella. I think I must. I must have. Paella is basically just a bigger version of that because that has so so you know sausages in there. It has fucking lobster in it, and it's like a, a well, I've definitely of... never had no lobster paella, but I want some. Oh yeah, I mean for me, paellas always have like a lobster or some sort of seafood thing. You know? Really? Then, then I mean, maybe for me, I haven't had it before. Yeah, it's from Spain. It's a Spanish dish. Huh. Well. Yeah. I can't wait for tomorrow. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of tomorrow, I guess I'm sleeping over because I can't wait for tomorrow also. <laughs> With the amount of no. oil. All you gotta do is go upstairs. But I mean, right, Rob's at home, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lucky bastard. The amount of oil she puts into that would make you sick if you if you looked at it while yeah. it's being cooked. Don't, it's, don't look too hard. And it's vegetable oil too. Yeah. It's not like nice, fresh, clean olive oil. Wow. Extra virgin. Out, it's know, all it's fucking fatty. It's vegetable all. Oil. It's all bad for you. Don't worry. Yeah, I'll die soon. Well, at least it's not soy. Through the sodium content, content on that. Still no, still no lexicon, huh? I'm telling you, when we talk about murders and shit. Did you do any research on this guy? I know who. Quarrel? Quarrel? No. Quarrel. I gotta say it right. Quarrel. Yeah, make sure you say it right, because people might think you're saying quarrel. Exactly. Yeah. Alright. So let's get the... Uh, Let's get the. Yeah. Oh, I still have to listen to that voice, man. Do you want, do you want to hear it? Yeah. Okay. So I can know what the hell it was like. It was a good one. Let's see. I'm going to pause this. <laughs> 